Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the first Monday of the month, which means it's time for McDougal Monday, where we are going to get a brand new lecture by Dr. John McDougal, and who knows, we might even see Mary, and then you'll also have time to ask some questions. So today, Dr. McDougal is going to be giving a brand new lecture on hypertension, and he's going to be discussing drugs versus diet. Please welcome Dr. John McDougal. It's always great to see you. Well, thanks, AJ. Charles, you got the record button on because we're going to do this just once. <laughs> no, it's, it's fun. He, you don't see him, but he, he we have this yeah. system where he, he lets me know that it's working. Well, you know, I just want the audience to know that uh, uh, Chef AJ and Charles have given me an opportunity to put together a series of lectures, which are basically what I'd like to be able to tell you if you were my patient about different problems that you have. I know you get all kinds of stories and you don't know what to believe. And you know, it, the information has generally not been provided for you in a user-friendly and succinct manner. So I've done these one hour lectures and this will be, oh, I don't know, six or seven in a series. We did breast cancer, heart disease, diabetes, autoimmune diseases, obesity. So I don't know, we're, we're getting right on there. I'm kind of kind of got, gotten most of the important subjects of uh, problems that people come to me you know, with. Those are, you know, overweight, high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease and cancer. That's essentially it. I should also do one on GI disease. Maybe we'll do that sometime in the near future. That's, that's one that we get a lot of questions on, Dr. Mm -hmm. McDougall. Well, you know, it's, it's one that needs to be addressed because people believe that what you put in your intestinal tract has little or nothing to do with its health. And of course, that's just Plain and simple, not true. So let's go on and uh, see if we can get a presentation up here. That'll be fun. Well, you've always said it's the food and all the diseases seem to have a link to the food. <laughs> it's the food. Yes, it's the food. It is so, you know, it is it's so hard for people to get their minds wrapped around it because we've gotten so much education from food industry, from the drug companies, from the doctor businesses and so on that have taught us to not look to food to the cause and solution of our problems, but it's so obvious. I mean, if you were a farmer, you were growing crops, would you be concerned about the soil? So as a doctor, I'm concerned about the soil. I wanna know that you're being grown the right way and food is basically everything. You know, even, even problems like lung cancer have a relationship to food and skin cancers and all kinds of problems are related to food, at least in part. What I'd like to talk to you about is hypertension, high blood pressure. And this is the, the frank discussion that your doctor should be having with you if you have concerns about your blood pressure. Probably you know that high blood pressure leads to strokes, doesn't lead to heart attacks, leads to heart failure, and what we're gonna discuss is the fact that high blood pressure is really not a disease. It's a sign of underlying sickness in the body. Now we could take care of it with drugs or we could take care of it with diet, but there's only really one way to take care of it correctly. And that is you must deal with the food because that's the cause. Uh, an article I just recently read called Timeline of History of Hypertensive Treatment. Interesting discussion about high blood pressure. And what they noted in there was that it was written in 2016, this particular article was, they said that it is surprising that only about 50 years ago, hypertension was considered an essential malady. In other words, something kind of to be expected and not a treatable condition. And the first drugs that were introduced were the diuretics, the thiazide diuretics, and they were introduced in the late 1950s. So you know, in my 54 years of practicing medicine, I've been exposed to this study by study, treatment recommendations by treatment recommendations. I, I've followed this all along in real time. And I'd like to share with you what I've learned and what I've come to understand about high blood pressure. Your blood pressure is something you can measure. <clears throat> and again, they've only been measuring it for about 50 years, just when I started practicing medicine came the technology to do that. And that's with a, uh, a, a stethoscope and uh, a blood pressure cuff. Now, one thing I, you wanna note from the beginning is that the blood pressures you get at home 
are the ones that doctors should be counting on. Not, not the blood pressure you get in a doctor's office. Too often you're, you're excited, you're afraid, afraid, you're anxious, and your blood pressure is artificially raised in that kind of office setting. So when you go to manage your blood pressure, uh, whether it's uh, to see whether or not you have the condition or if you're in the process of treating it with diet or drugs, you wanna take the measurements at home, write them down, discuss what you find with your private medical doctor. I think once a day is enough. I mean, if you're a healthy person, maybe, maybe once a year you should check your blood pressure. But if you're uh, ill with problems, uh, particularly those related to high blood pressure, then you know, don't check it five times a day or 10 times a day. Once a day is plenty. Your morning reading is going to be your highest reading. So on average, so throughout the day, your blood pressure generally comes down. The uh, measurement of high blood pressure is something very convenient and relatively inexpensive these days. You could go to uh, uh, most pharmacies and you could buy a blood pressure cuff, an automatic one, where you don't have to use a stethoscope. And they cost between 20 and $75. Now, let me take a minute and uh, tell you how this works and what we're listening to and what it means. Uh, you see the picture of the arm here and uh, uh, something labeled the brachial artery. If you put the cuff around the arm above the brachial artery, like you see positioned here, and then you blow up the cuff and you listen with a stethoscope over that brachial artery, what will happen is the sound of the blood flow will disappear. And that's because the artery is completely closed, so no blood gets through it. And then you start decreasing the pressure in the cuff, and eventually you reach the highest pressure in the system where the blood can finally get through the brachial artery and you hear the slapping sound when you put the stethoscope just distal to the cuff over the brachial artery, it slaps blum, 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 like that. And then what happens as you continue to lower your cuff pressure is you reach a pressure, the lowest pressure, which is diastolic. The lowest pressure is when the blood vessels no longer slap together. They're constantly open because you've reached the lowest pressure in the system. And that's what blood pressure is. It's a reading of the highest and the lowest pressure in the system, it's easily, easily monitored, easily measured, safely measured. The only problem is what you do with the information. Then you can get into trouble or get out of trouble. Now, as far as readings go, I would say pretty much a, a normal blood pressure would be considered a 100 to 110 over maybe 70 to 80. That, those are generally the figures. And, and those are typical of Americans, which are in general sick people. If you look at other populations, for example, you look at uh, rural Africans, still living on a starch-based diet, you'll find their blood pressures will run you know, 70 or 80 over 30 or 40 millimeters of mercury. And of course, they're in excellent health. As the system becomes ill, which is what causes the blood pressure to go up, as the cardiovascular system becomes ill, the numbers you get when you check with a outrig like uh, what we have right here, a blood pressure cuff and a sphygmomometer, the pressures go up. And a high blood pressure might be considered 180 over 120. Actually, I would consider that malignant hypertension, which needs uh, you know, pretty prompt treatment, malignant hypertension does. And then as you get uh, better readings, uh, we still consider those high blood pressure, like say 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. A again, considering a normal pressure being 100, 110 over say 70, 80 millimeters of mercury. And that's what they tell you here is a normal blood pressure is uh, 120 over 80. Those are the kinds of numbers that you'll be getting. And again, remind yourself through this lecture that a very, very high blood pressure is 120 over 100, excuse me, 180 over 120 millimeters of mercury. Uh, how common is high blood pressure? Well, you know, at least 20% of the population has high blood pressure. And one piece of data that I read, 40% of people over the age of 25 have an elevated blood pressure. And this is a major risk factor for the condition of your arteries. This is not a disease. 
it's a sign of the condition of the arteries. People don't die of high blood pressure. You know, in my whole career of 54 years, I've never seen anybody die of high blood pressure. In fact, the only thing I can imagine that it would look like death by high blood pressure would be a reflection of a movie I saw in 1981 called Scanners, where aliens, they, uh, with to, to telemetry, they, they would get us native people on earth all excited and we'd shake and eventually our heads would explode. I mean, is that what dying of high blood pressure is like? If it is, I've never seen it. It's a silent disease, so to speak. That's the only thing I could picture is that Scanners movie, if people actually died from elevated blood pressure. It would be an ugly thing. Uh, why does the blood pressure go up? Because it's supposed to. It's a normal reaction that the body has. It's a, an adjustment that it makes as the cardiovascular system becomes ill, sick. And that's due to the food. And the ser most serious manifestations of this sickness of the cardiovascular system would be a failure in the brain, in other words, a stroke, or a failure in the heart. Well, that might be a heart attack, but more commonly it would be heart failure. In 1985, I published a book called McDougall's Medicine, A Challenging Second Opinion. And I, I worked for six years to put that book together. And Fortunately, many years later, I could tell you that there's not a word I'd correct in that book. It's, it's an excellent discussion of medicine up until that time. But the, the important thing for you to understand is very little has changed since 1985. And in my chapter on high blood pressure, by the way, you can have this book for free. Yeah, but all you do is you just go to our website, you go to, to our shop, you know, where, where you buy things and you enter this particular book. And there are a few others of them that I own. And when you get to checkout, yeah, there's no charge. We, you can download it for free. Anyway, in the chapter on high blood pressure, what I say is the blood pressure goes up because of excitement. Like if you're afraid when you go to the doctor's office or if you exercise or you drop a bowling ball on your foot. Due to excitement, the pump pumps harder and faster and the pressure goes up. Well, this isn't associated with any bad health, is it? The other reason the blood pressure would go up would be is if you overfill the system with fluid. And what we're talking about here is eating a lot of salt. When you eat a lot of salt, that brings in water into the cardiovascular system, and that causes the blood pressure to go up. And that's of some importance, and it gives you also something to do. You can go on a low salt diet to help with your elevated blood pressure. There's something even more important than that. And that's the, uh, the last drawing that I put in this book back in 1985. That's about peripheral resistance. And that's the important thing. And that's what we're gonna be talking about is the blood vessels become narrowed and the blood becomes viscous. And as a consequence, we create peripheral resistance, which causes the pressure to go up. It's like when you're out watering flowers and you decide you want to water something 10, 15, 20 feet away, but you don't want to walk over there. What do you do? You put your thumb over the end of the hose. You increase the resistance to flow and the pressure goes up. That's what high blood pressure is measuring, is the resistance of flow in your cardiovascular system. A part of that resistance to flow has to do with atherosclerosis. We have the pipes and the pipes get diseased it's called atherosclerosis, and the walls get thickened, and you develop pustules and scar and calcium and all kinds of things that narrow the lumen of your arteries throughout your entire body. We're talking about 60,000 miles of vessels, and many of them are larger vessels, and you can see this change that occurs. So as life goes on, for the typical American who eats the rich Western diet, you have narrowing of your arteries. Of course, fortunately, you can reverse this. Eat a good diet and you show regression of the arteries and the, the pipes open up a bit. The other thing that causes the, uh, the arteries to narrow is are spasms. These are made of muscles, these arteries are. And there are certain things that we eat like bad cholesterol that cause the artery walls to go into spasm. Again, increasing peripheral resistance 
And then there's this, this thing that we do three, four times a day that increases peripheral resistance. We cause the blood to become viscous. It's sludging of the blood. And you see here the flow of blood, very rapid. In this situation before a meal, the blood cells hit and bounce off each other. They negatively repel each other so you have a good flow. And then you feed the fat. And what happens is this, you see the blood cells now stick together. There's all kinds of sludge. You can see the tremendous increase in peripheral resistance that occurs. One thing I wanna point out here is that vegetable fat, you know, your health food vegetable fats, they cause more severe sludging and more prolonged sludging of the blood than do animal fats. And this sludging lasts uh, six, eight, 10 hours a day. Well, the typical American eats a, one high fat meal after another every three or four hours. So their blood is constantly in this viscous state. We see this in, in human experiments. Uh, for example, you see the, the setup here with a microscope, uh, the doctors looking at the whites of the eye of a apparently 44 year old fireman. And you see a picture of the blood vessels of the white eye on the left there. And you can see there's lots, lots of blood flow, very relaxed blood vessels. And then the high fat meal is fed. This is 67% of the calories is fat. Typical meal that I've eaten, that many of you have eaten in the past. The oxygen, what we call oxygen tension or oxygen content in the blood drops 20% after a single high fat meal due to poor circulation. So uh, sounds like high blood pressure is bad because it hurts the arteries. I would understand if you went to that, uh, that conclusion is, uh, you know, pressures are pressures and, you know, they cause damage and stretching and so on. And normal blood pressure being at 120 over 80, as the pressure goes up, we have, see an increased risk of dying of heart disease. And we come to the, uh, the, the logical, although incorrect, conclusion that what is happening is the pressure itself is damaging the arteries. No, it's, it's, it's backwards. It's, it's the heart before the, the horse before the cart type thing. And healthy weightlifters, double leg presses. If you measure their blood pressure while they're lifting the weights, their blood pressure goes up on average to 320 over 250 millimeters of mercury. And in one subject in this particular paper, the blood pressure went to 480 over 350 millimeters of mercury. Not a single blood vessel breaks. Healthy blood vessels don't break. Please understand this. Well, let me take it a little bit further. In, in this particular experiment, uh, investigators, they used a custom made motorized syringe to raise the pressure in cadaver arteries. They took arteries from 10 people who died, fresh arteries, and they uh, put their, their syringe pump into one end of the artery, closed off the other, and raised the blood pressure in the arteries, for example, in the aorta, which is the big blood vessel in the in the central part of the body, they raised the blood pressure to 3,000 millimeters of mercury before the blood vessel broke. And in medium-sized blood vessels like those that are present in your brain circulation, your cerebral arteries, the average blood pressure that would cause a, a rupture in the artery wall was 1,786 millimeters. Healthy blood vessels don't break. You know, probably the extreme of putting pressure on blood vessel walls is when the cardiologist goes in with their catheter and they blow up a balloon and the vessel walls don't break, yet they blow the balloon up to a pressure of 12,000 millimeters of mercury. Healthy vessels don't break. High blood pressure does not cause damage to the vessels. High blood pressure is a reflection of the health of the vessels. When your pressure goes up, you're talking about your circulation being sick. You're talking about the heart, the blood vessel walls, and the blood itself being unhealthy. And as a result, you die from the consequence of unhealthy arteries.
not the pressure. Let's, let's do a little summary here. Uh, here you see a large opening where well, you begin with a black arrow. You begin with a, a large opening and you have very strong vessel walls. And then as life goes on, you cause progressive damage to the walls. And what happens is they, they enlarge and they close the lumen. So the lumen becomes a, a smaller diameter, increasing the peripheral resistance. The pressure goes up as a consequence of the arteries becoming sicker. And eventually they get to a point where they're so sick that we have rupture of plaques that cause heart attacks and strokes. And we talked about this in our, our, our lecture on heart disease about how you have a heart attack from plaque rupture. And most strokes are also due to plaque rupture. You see that right here. Let's see if we can find a picture. Yeah, what happens is the postule breaks, all right? So the, the rotten arteries, they fail. And it, at the time they fail, the blood pressure is up because the arteries are so sick. All right, so you should understand by now that high blood pressure is not the culprit. High pressure, blood pressure is a sign of the health of the arteries. Well, okay, the body naturally regulates the blood pressure. It has to, it has to go up because the heart has to deliver blood and nutrients to the tissues. And we have that increased peripheral resistance to deliver the oxygen, to deliver the nutrients, to, to take away the waste products. In order to do that, the system has to raise the blood pressure. It's normal, it's natural. And the body regulates the blood pressure just perfectly fine until you start introducing drugs. And then what you do is you paralyze the cardiovascular system in various places. And as a consequence, you, you develop abnormally low blood pressures. I mean, normal would be the blood pressure would be up, right? To try and compensate for all the disease. You give a drug to lower the blood pressure. Well, we just talked about how the blood pressure is not the problem. Okay, the, the blood pressure elevation is the result of the problem. So you interfere as we do in the medical business and you cause the blood pressure to go down with medication. Now, what we're gonna talk about here is only a circumstance where people are on medications. I don't care how low your blood pressure goes if you're not taking medications, as long as you're not sick, you know, as long as you're not injured and bleeding to death. It's normal, it's natural. The blood pressure will go low to levels where the bottom number may be 50, 60, 70. The top number may be 70, 80, 90. And it's normal and it's not, it's safe, it's just fine. As long as you're not causing it to go low with medication. Let me uh, explain to you what happens here. Uh, this is a, a look at the systolic blood pressure, so the top number in relation to dying, overall mortality. And you see here the top number, remember the top number is 110 or 100 or maybe as high as 120. You see up here, very high top numbers in the 220, 240 range. That indicates a very sick cardiovascular system. And these people have very high risk of uh, dying of congestive heart failure or having a stroke. Well, in this case, where you're dealing with these very, very high blood pressures, if you lower the blood pressure with medication, in other words, you lower it artificially, and you lower it down to about 140 millimeters of mercury, you see a reduction in risk of dying. And this is important. And this is where the, the medical profession can, can have some bragging rights because when blood pressure pills were initially, initially used, uh, they were used for people who had malignant hypertension. These are people that were very, very sick. There was a study called the veteran study and they gave them diuretics and they saw that they reduced the risk of sudden death and congestive heart failure. All right, so you lower the blood pressure with medication down to, we're talking about the top number, remember, down to around 140. If you lower it further than that, say down to 120, 180, 60, you increase your risk of dying. Overtreating high blood pressure is harmful with medications. One thing that happens is you have an increased risk of fractures and falls. The other thing is, is that you're, you're working against the body's normal reaction to a diseased cardiovascular system. In other words, your heart and lungs, or excuse me, your heart and brain 
need some extra pressure because they're all clogged up, right? Well, you go in with the drugs and you start lowering the pressure and now the perfusion pressure to critical organs like the brain and the heart have been compromised. And so you have an increased risk of stroke and heart attack by artificially lowering the blood pressure. And here you see it in terms of the top number, systolic pressure. You know, three or four times is great. Your chance of having a heart attack when you get down here to a blood pressure of 60, which many of you consider normal and some of your doctors try and get you to do to lower your pressure down to 60 or 70 or 80 with the drugs, you know, the more the better. We've got to try and make you normal. Well, when you, when you do that and you pass, say, in this case, the top number down 140 down, the top number being, say, 80, 90, or 100, you increase your risk of strokes by two times. The risk of dying of heart attacks is increased by four times. And here it is in terms of looking at the bottom number. You see the same, what we call J-shaped or U-shaped curve of mortality. In other words, you take care of very sick people. In this case, they're talking about the bottom number being higher than 100. You start giving your medication and you lower the bottom number here to around 80 to 90. And this is, this is the, the bottom of the trough. This is when you see reductions in stroke and congestive heart failure up until about say 80 or 90. And then as you aggressively treat the blood pressure and you over treat the blood pressure, what happens when you get down to normal, say 70 or super normal, say 60, you increase the risk of strokes by 200%, the risk of a heart attacks by as much as 400%. It should make sense to you. The heart and the brain need to have a flow of blood that's adequate. And these drugs artificially reduce the perfusion fresh pressure to these critical organs. Overtreatment is dangerous. So what's the, what's the sweet spot? What's, what's the target for lowering blood pressure? As a doctor, I have to take care of people who have elevated blood pressure and I don't wanna undertreat them and I don't wanna overtreat them. And so what I use as a uh, target is about a blood pressure of 150 over 90, all right? It would be too high. In other words, they need more medication if the blood pressure was say 160 or 100. And I'd be over treating if the blood pressure was below 140 over 80. So this is what your doctor should be treating you for a target blood pressure where you have the least chance of having a stroke or heart attack. And that number happens to be on average 150 over 90 millimeters of mercury. You do not want to be treated to a normal level, not with drugs. All right, let's take a look at recommendations for major organizations and see how that fits in with what I just tried to tell you. Uh, the Cochrane Collaboration. The Cochrane Collaboration involves 40,000 experts, scientists, doctors from around the world. And they're in over 100 countries. And they're the most respected organization when it comes to looking for unbiased information. I rely on them a lot. And the Cochrane Collaboration, when they reviewed the treatment of high blood pressure, what they said is treating patients to lower than standard blood pressures in other words, 140 to 160 over 90 to 100 does not reduce mortality or sickness. Morbidity is illness. So, so they say you, you should not lower the blood pressure below, say, 160 to 140, and the, the bottom number being 90 to 100, which you know fits in with the, the target that I just showed you. Uh, the uh, British guidelines which came out originally in 2004 and they still hold today. They say that you shouldn't start treating a person with high blood pressure with medication unless their blood pressure is sustained. That means for months at 160 over 100 or greater because there's no benefit. The Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, uh, they come up with some recommendations every few years on with their ex expert panels, uh, the, this is the eighth, which is the most recent joint national committee on recommendations of what we should treat with medication now, people with high blood pressure. 
And what they say is this, this is the new guidelines. They say people younger than 60, you should treat them to a blood pressure of 140 over 90 or higher. Somebody my age, on, at 60 years of age, they've upped the number recently. They used to say even people who are older should be treated to say 140 over 80. They now say that the goal, the target should be on medication, a blood pressure of 150 over 90 or higher, not lower, or higher. So the explanation I gave you for what you ought to do with blood pressure medications is consistent with what your doctors are being told they should do as far as treating you. Unfortunately, doctors are influenced by a lot of things and they're too often not in your best interest. So we have uh, ways of lowering blood pressure <clears throat> and uh, they were introduced uh, in the late 50s you know, when, when I was you know, a young doctor. And these are various medications and the medications fall into five classes. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on these with you. There are diuretics and they work by poisoning the kidneys and causing the kidneys to lose fluid. Poison is the correct terminology. Poisons disrupt the normal body functions through chemical reactions. I'm not I'm just saying this for, for its emotional value. This is the right word, poison. <laughs> Beta blockers, they poison the heart muscle, so it becomes weak. In fact, people on beta blockers, they'll often complain that they can't walk upstairs because their muscles are so weak. So beta blockers, uh, they block the adrenaline, which is a, a powerful hormone that causes the heart to beat strongly. And in that way, they weaken the heart and they lower the blood pressure. ACE inhibitors, they're one of the poisons that affect the ad adrenal output and the hormones. They prevent the production of angiotensin II, which is a hormone which constricts the blood vessels and raises the pressure. So ACE inhibitors, they're poisons of the adrenal gland. Angiotensin receptor blockers, they work at another level as far as the adrenal system goes. They block the, the action, not just the production, the action of this powerful hormone angiotensin II. They're not the same drugs. Doctors will often interchange them, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. They're different medications with different risks and we'll talk about that in just a minute. And then there are calcium channel blockers, which are poisons that poison the, the, the blood vessels so they relax. So you, you poison the system at various areas and often you, you poison the system three or four or five different ways. And what happens is you artificially decrease the perfusion pressure to the brain and the heart and you increase your risk of dying if you treat too aggressively. Now let's talk about how I treat my patients with high blood pressure. I use the drug that was first tested and the only one really that we can substantiate works to reduce the risk of stroke and heart failure. The drug I use is called chlorothaladone. It was introduced in the late 50s. It's not the same as hydrochlorothiazide. I know you think it is because they're both diuretics. It's not the same. It was chlorothaladone, which this paper was, uh, was a result of. It was major outcomes in high-risk hypertensive patients, randomized to angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, calcium channel blockers versus diuretics by chlorothaladone. And guess what? It was the chlorothaladone that worked and the others didn't. But there are a couple of papers here you might wanna read. And I know many of you are gonna go back and watch this presentation and look up the studies and see whether or not I presented them to you accurately and without exaggeration. And you'll find that uh, there's darn good evidence for you to be treated with chlorothaladone as opposed to hydrochlorothiazide. That's what I use and there are reasons why. I don't use calcium channel blockers. And the main reason is adjusted 
risk ratio for myocardial infarction of our heart attacks was increased by about 60% among users of cal calcium channel blockers. So you add these calcium channel blockers to the system and you increase your risk of dying of heart disease, which is what you're trying to accomplish is not die of heart disease. I think these drugs should never be used. They increase your chances of suicide by fivefold. They cause you to be constipated. They're associated with a risk of overall cancer and specifically breast cancer. No reason to use this kind of medication. Well, there is a reason, of course, because you know they're brand name now, but they came out as, uh, excuse me, they're generic now, but they came out as brand name drugs. So what happens is we have the original medications, which are a brand name, we can charge a lot of money for them. And then they become generic and not that they lose their, their benefits, but you, they get pushed aside for the new brand name drug, which you can charge exorbitant amounts of money for. And that's how new medications become popular. It's not that the old medications don't work, it's just they're not as profitable. So I never prescribe calcium channel blockers and I never prescribe angiotensin receptor blockers. Remember, I told you that your doctors often confuse ACE inhibitors, which stop the production of uh, angiotensin II, and uh, angiotensin receptor blockers, which prevent the hormone from acting at the tissue level. Now, doctors think these are the same medications. In fact, they think that ARBs are better, a angiotensin receptor blockers, because they don't cause the troublesome side effect of coughing as much. So likely you've been switched from ACE inhibitors to angiotensin re block, bo receptor blockers, but not in my practice you wouldn't be because I don't use this drug. So uh, sick people take medications. Let's get down to it. Healthy people don't. And you, you wanna do what you can to safely get off any medications you're on. In this case, we're talking about getting off blood pressure medications. This is how I do it with my patients. I get them to change their diet. They check their blood pressures at home. They need to be pre prepared for a precipitous drop in blood pressure. I mean, you stop the, the viscous nature of the blood, the blood slotch, sludging, and in a matter of hours, you decrease peripheral resistance. So be prepared. You may end up with a really low blood pressure really quickly, and what that means, you have to lower your doses of medication so you don't become hypotensive, get in an accident, you know, fall over and hurt yourself. You want to avoid hypotension, too low a blood pressure. So you check your blood pressure in the morning because that's where it's going to be the highest. You exercise a little bit, but not too much. You know, you should not start an intensive exercise program until you've established a good diet. There are many reasons for this that we could talk about. Uh, you, I reduce medications one at a time. Often people come in with a whole bag full of drugs and they'll be taking multiple doses of the different high blood pressure pills. And so I start with what I think are the most dangerous, which would be the calcium channel blockers and the angiotensin receptor blockers. And we just plain and simple stop those because they're just too darn dangerous. And then what I'll do is I'll slowly reduce the other medications that the patient is on. Maybe cut the dose in half uh, every three or four days, maybe quicker. You know, if their blood pressures are coming down quite quickly, I'll often stop the medication all of a sudden. And you could do that with blood pressure lowering medications, except for maybe beta blockers. Beta blockers, you may want to stop, stop a little bit slowly because the body adapts to beta blockers. And, you know, at the very least, when you stop them rapidly, you might get a rapid heartbeat that could be troublesome to you, at least worry you. So otherwise, you know, I have no hesitation at all stopping these medications. And of course, I have a lot of experience doing this, having done it for close to 50 years. I feel very comfortable about doing it. So we, uh, we reduce one medication at a time, maybe cut it in half every three or four days. If the blood pressure is lower than 150 over 90, then I get a little bit more aggressive at reducing the medications. But whatever you do, you know, you don't want to be in a situation where you're being overtreated and you end up with the blood pressure so low that you get in an auto accident or you fall over and hurt yourself. It's safer to have too high a blood pressure than too low a blood pressure. I know that's hard for people who believe so much in drugs. 
But when you're managing medications and trying to get people off, you have to be aware of the consequences and, and make the right moves. And by the way, this is not difficult. You know, I, I, I teach doctors. We, we had as many as seven doctors working for us at uh, the clinic when we used to take care of companies like Whole Foods and, and other, other companies that came and brought their employees to us. I had as many as seven physicians that worked with me. Now, all of these were really good doctors, of course, board certified physicians. But I could teach them how to reduce the medications in like five minutes. I'd give them a sheet on what I thought they had to do with medications and they'd read it over and they'd use their own judgment. But pretty much by and large, they would, they, would, they would do this and find out the patients turned out really, really well. So it wouldn't be hard for your physician to learn how to take you off medications. But the difficulty is in the fact that we have no education on reducing medications. Doctors don't know how to do it. In fact, they're taught by the drug companies to never do it. You're told, the doctor is told, and you're told by the doctor that once you're on these medications, you're on for life. I mean, think about it. Yeah, you are on for life unless you fix the problem, which is the food. But if you decide to go that route, then you're gonna to have to have somebody supervise, give you a little hint on how to reduce your medications. No, it's not that there haven't been many people who have done this without medical supervision. It's just that I have to advise, of course, that you have a competent trained healthcare provider helping you make the decisions. What do you do with the extra drugs? You know, most of my patients start up with a whole bathroom cabinet full of medications and they don't need to take them. Now we get 90% we get of people to reduce or stop their medications, particularly high blood pressure and diabetic medications in seven days. What do you do with these drugs? Don't throw them in the toilet. These are poisons that will, will affect the fish and other sea life and the pollute your streams and lakes and oceans. And I'm serious. You need to take these drugs to your local pharmacy where they'll put them in a to toxic waste depot and dispose of them that way. Now, I, I, I wanna mention you really wanna be off medication. Sick people take medications. Healthy people don't. People who had lots of sickness, they have a checkerboard abdomen with the scars from their previous surgeries. Sick people, they have doctor's appointments, you know, every month or two or three. And they're the ones that support our local hospitals. Yes, they do. You don't want to be in that particular business. You wanna get out of the system, get out of the medical business. The only way I know that you can get out of your, get out of the medical business is to stop being ill, to regain your health, to fix the problem and the problems of food. I mean, think about it for a minute. Doesn't that make sense? You don't want your best friend to be your doctor? I, mean, I don't want morticians in my life. I don't, I don't like it when I have lawyers working for me because I know I'm in trouble. Why would you want to have physicians as your best friends as somebody you have littered on your calendar to see? Get out of the business. All right, let's talk about uh, dietary therapy. I told you about the drugs, told you the, the, the drawbacks of, of treating with medication. You really never get healthy. What you do is you temporize some of the problems, you treat the signs and symptoms, but you never get your health back. You're just an overweight, sick person carrying around a bag full of drugs. So to fix the problem, you gotta, you gotta fix the food. And uh, Fixing the food means more than just lowering the sodium content of the food. You've got to change the entire diet. You've got to eat a starch-based diet. Probably the, the best uh, example that I can give you about how it's not the salt is to give you the example of the bacon. It's the pig that's making you sick. It's eating the pig. The only way they can get you to eat the pig because it's so disgusting is to load it with salt. We call this non-discretionary sodium intake. It's about 75% of the sodium you eat. You don't even have any choice. It's in your cheeses, in your meats, in your sausages, et cetera. That's how you get the sodium, but it's not really the salt. 
It's the, the vehicles that they're delivered to you and the things on your plate, the bacon, the cheese, et cetera. Now, let me show you how ineffective lowering salt intake is in terms of solving a blood pressure problem. Uh, in, as, in, as an average, a whole bunch of studies were put together and it was uh, determined how much lowering salt intake would have effect, an effect on your pressure. And so what the research showed, is, and again, it's based on many studies, is if you reduce uh, sodium intake by 1,725 milligrams down to 2,300 milligrams a day of sodium, which is what's recommended, that maneuver, which is to take about, oh, maybe three quarters of a teaspoon of salt out of your diet, that maneuver results in a reduction of the top number by one to five millimeters of mercury. Hardly detectable. And the bottom number by six tenths to three millimeters of mercury. Hardly even detectable. So if you're going to focus on just salt out of your diet, you're not going to solve the problem. You got to get rid of the, of the, of the vehicles that the salt comes in. Like the bacon, you know, the roast beef. Well, uh, anyway, uh, the, most, uh, the most impressive uh, low sodium diet experiment that was ever done was the, uh, the DASH diet. And doctors talk about this a lot, about the DASH diet. It's basically the Mediterranean diet uh, and they took the salt out of it. They fed uh, three levels of sodium intake, 3000 milligrams, 2400 milligrams and 1,500 milligrams. And again, what they saw just by variation in salt was only a tiny reduction in blood pressure. For those people who had significant high blood pressure, the drop was 11 over five millimeters of mercury. For people who didn't have high blood pressure, taking that much salt of the diet, cutting it in half from 3,000 milligrams a day to 1,500 milligrams a day, the reduction of blood pressure was only five over three millimeters of mercury. You, you, your blood pressure varies that much when you get up or sit down or stub your toe. If you want to talk about the effect of, uh, of serious sodium restriction, we need to talk about Walter Kempner. You know, he's one of my mentors. He's one of my heroes. He's, he's the doctor that taught me how to practice diet therapy. He's a doctor who made me very comfortable about the foods that I, I, uh, I chose for you to eat. He's the doctor that showed me that diet therapy is the most powerful therapy that there is. Walter Kempner, he was an internist, came from Germany, worked at Duke University in Durham, North, North Carolina for 70 years. His results are amazing. Decreased heart size in patients, uh, stopped the loss of kidney function, improved their kidney function cured diabetic retinopathy, cured essentially all of his type two diabetics. People were in such severe heart failure that their heart was enlarged to the size of their chest cavity. He put them on the Kempner diet and get these people back living again. Well, he fed a very, very low salt diet. In fact, salt sodium was the big deal for Walter Kempner. His diet also happened to be vegan high starch, low fat. What he, what he fed his patients as a therapeutic diet is he fed them a diet of white rice, fruit, fruit juice, and table sugar. If you were a really trim patient and you were at risk of losing weight on the Kempter diet, they would add as many as 2000 calories of sugar a day, white sugar to the diet. This was a 93% carbohydrate diet carbohydrate coming from rice and fruit and fruit juice and sugar, very low fat diet. Walter Kempner, I hear, used to wash the white rice just to get some extra sodium off of it. His diet was far less than 500 milligrams of sodium a day, but the results were profound. Well, let me just tell you about the blood pressure results. He, he took care of, this was before the drug came in. Remember I told you the drugs were st first started in the late 50s. Well, Walter Kempner was the only game in town. People come from all over the world to get the Kempner treatment. 
and he'd get people with malignant hypertension. Now, people are ready to have strokes and have, go into heart failure. They're really sick. And he put them on the Kempter diet, and he got 60% of the patients to, to develop normal blood pressures just by feeding them the diet. You want to talk about lowering blood pressure profoundly, you do it with a Kempter approach. And that severe sodium restriction has a big effect on the cardiovascular system. It might not be all positive, but it has a big effect on it. And Walter Kempner was one of the first people who demonstrated reversal of artery disease. Remember through this lecture, I've talked to you about how the blood pressure, blood pressure goes up because the arteries are clogged. They're sick, they have atherosclerosis. Well, in addition to the lower sodium intake, his program cleaned out the arteries as you see by this EKG. Uh, the EKG, if you look at the far left side, you see what we call an ST depression. That means the heart muscle is not receiving enough blood flow. It's not getting enough oxygen. This, this dip right here, that's what it's, what it's telling us. And a normal would be the ST segment being upright. Well, look at this patient. You see in the left-hand side, the ST segments are reversed. This man has serious blockages of his arteries. And a few months later, you see that the ST segments are upright. So not only did Walter Kempner lower the blood pressure by severe sodium restriction, he made the arteries healthy again. And you can do that too. Well, let me tell you what we do at the McDougall program is we serve salt. We have salt shakers on the table. We don't put salt in the food because when you mix up the salt in the super stew, the taste disappears. But we'll serve the super stew very low salt with a salt shaker there for you to put a little bit of salt on the surface of the food where your tongue tastes it. The basic McDougal diet is made of about 500 milligrams of sodium. If you add a half a teaspoon of salt a day, that's another 1100 milligrams of sodium. A half a teaspoon of salt on the surface of the food is a lot of taste. And now you've brought the sodium intake from the McDougal diet, 500 milligrams plus 1100 milligrams, you brought it up to 1600 milligrams a day. This is a very low sodium diet by most people's standards. If you have a massive heart attack and you end up in the intensive care unit in your hospital, their low to low sodium diet is 2,000 milligrams of sodium, which is 400 milligrams an hour with a half a teaspoon of salt added to it. And boy, do we get results. Uh, you take care, look at the people with high blood pressure. I showed you those on the DASH diet who had high blood pressure. Well, we get even better results than the DASH program. Starting with people who have blood pressures of 140 over 90, and most of these people are on medication. The drop in blood pressure is 18 over 11 millimeters of mercury. And most important for you to notice is that we took them off their blood pressure medications. In almost all cases, 90% of the people in our program studied over 10 years, 1,703 people. 90% of people were able to reduce or stop their blood pressure medications and their diabetic medications and most other medications just in seven days. So this summarize, this is my approach. Uh, if you came to see me with high blood pressure, and I hope your doctors at least look at this as a possibility for caring for you. If the doctor didn't want to do it or, or you decided you didn't want to go through this type of change, there are lots of doctors out there be very happy to, to give you drugs in the seven minute visit you have with them. It's a good business folks pushing drugs. Believe me, I've been in this business long enough to know how to make money. So I put people on uh, the strict McDougal diet. And if uh, you're not overweight, this may include some nuts and seeds and avocados. If you're overweight, a well, weight loss is part of the reduction in blood pressure and the improvement in general health. So I restrict the nuts and seeds and avocados. I allow you a half a teaspoon of salt on the surface of your food. But if you're not responding as rapidly as I'd like, I may ask you to cut the salt out completely, but that's a problem because that's what you like. 
You love the salt. If you're not enjoying the diet that we put you on or many other people put you on, it's because you're missing the salt. Just put the salt on the food and all of a sudden, voila, what a great recipe. Best soup I ever had, best stew I ever ate. Just put the salt on the food. We want you to eat the food. So you have high blood pressure? Well, let's just say you came in on a whole slew of drugs. I'm gonna switch you over to chlorothaladone because that's the drug that was tested that shows the benefits. Now the drugs lower blood pressure, but as far as reducing the risk of having a massive stroke or heart failure, it's only chlorothaladone that's been tested and shows benefits. So I'm gonna use chlorothaladone and I won't have to use much. You know, the 10 milligram tablets, I might have to have you split them in half. And you'll take that medication to lower the blood pressure down to uh, maybe 160 over 100. That's when you initiate drug therapy. You remember the British guidelines said so, the Cochrane collaboration said so, and probably the Joint Commission said so too. So if you run a higher blood pressure than 160 over 100, I'll put you on a little bit of chlorothaladone. Hopefully I'll be able to stop the other medications. And I'll treat you with uh, medication with the goal of getting your blood pressure down to, uh, let's say 140 over 85. I, I gave you a range here, 130 to 150 over 80 to 90. Well, that's a tough job to monitor the blood pressure and get it to this in such a narrow range. I'll tell you, that's difficult. I'll adjust your medications every four to seven days. See how you do, give you a chance on this dose. Likely you're gonna require fewer drugs after four to seven days. Monitor your blood pressure at home. You'll check it and you'll give me the results. I'm not gonna to go to your house. I mean, we do in the telemedicine program, we go to your house pretty much by the internet, but uh, you're gonna bring me a list of blood pressures and we're gonna make decisions based upon the blood pressure you've got for the previous week. And it, it takes time. You know, you most of the time we get people, as I said, 90% of people, we reduce or stop their medications in seven days, but sometimes it takes a little longer. And you shouldn't really give up being drug-free and normal blood pressure until you've lost all the excess body fat. Do you get down to trim body weight? Now I have to say there are some occasions, I can't really remember when they were because they weren't very, very many over my 50 plus years of practicing medicine. There are probably a couple of patients I had to add some of the other medications to in addition to chlorothaladone. But like I say, so few, I can't even remember. Well, that's what I think you should know about high blood pressure. And that's the way I'd like to see your doctors treat you. You're welcome to show them my presentation. If you're not getting cooperation because the doctor just doesn't want to learn new things or has a, a, a cooperative patient load and doesn't need to have somebody as disruptive as you are, if you want us to care for you, we run a 12 day telemedicine program and you can be in Ukraine and Shanghai and Sydney and we don't care where you are any place in the world. We'll come to you via the internet. And we have people right now from all over the world who are in our 12 day program. And our doctors will, will do histories and physicals on you. They'll give you, it's Dr. Lim right now that primarily does this will give you advice very similar to what I just shared with you with the goal of getting you off the medications and getting your health back. And we can do this big dent in your progress in 12 days uh, in the internet <clears throat> telemedicine program that we're running now. And you can find that on the website, drmcdougall.com. All right, uh, AJ, I enjoyed talking to people about high blood pressure. I hope I got some very difficult points across. Uh, but I certainly had a lot of fun sharing with you. That was wonderful. And like you say, we do have to watch it again. And I took some notes and it's funny because one of the things I wrote down is one of the most common questions I saw in the chat, which was, you said vegetable fats cause more sludging than animal fats. Why would that be so? And if that's the case, why are so many people still recommending oils, plant oils? Got me, got me why they're recommending oils. You know that I haven't for 46 years. Uh, I, why? I don't know. Uh, I can give you the studies that show that. But those of you who, uh, who take our class, you have all those studies available for you based on that. Or if you take the starch certification course, 
which we give you a certificate that says you, you have learned the starch solution. And people use this course to, uh, to run their own private, private sessions. Uh, they develop clientele, they make money. They put up our, our little plaque that says that you're certified in the starch solution. If you take that class, you get uh, all these studies too. Uh, anyway, the re that's what the research says. You can read the, the, uh, the initial studies. And you say, well, why, why aren't doctors studying this again? Well, why would you study it again? You know, show me where the money is. Anyway, vegetable oil causes a more severe and more prolonged sludging of the blood. Also, if you want to promote cancer, choose a vegetable oil, flaxseed oil, safflower oil, corn oil, much better at promoting cancer growth than animal fat. Yeah, I know you've been misled. Now, when the oil is in the vegetable, it's perfectly safe. But when you rip it out of the vegetable, you leave all the protein, vitamins, minerals, fibers, phytonutrients behind, all you have is pure oil, you're dealing with a medicine at best and a serious toxin at worst. You should not have oil in your diet. It's not natural. Shouldn't, shouldn't be included. It's disgusting. You won't even drink it. It's so disgusting if I handed you a glass of olive oil and asked you to drink it, you wouldn't. Or in the process, you'd throw up. It's disgusting. It's an emetic. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, <laughs> I, it is. Is it really? Yeah, that's what they say. Like I've heard from poison control centers that like that's what they suggest. If, if you can't get for the person in the hospital, uh, have them drink oil so they'll throw up. I learn something new every day, AJ. Well, thank you. So, I'm going to include that in my lecture. Thank you very much. I'm going to I'm going to Google it and verify it, but I have right. heard that. So so um, we're going to take the questions that were submitted in writing in advance, right. and then we'll get to the chat. And this one is from Debellis. How long should a person sit or be still before taking an at-home blood pressure reading? Well, you know that would depend on you. Uh, you, you may have to figure this out for your individual self. It may take you a while to calm down. And uh, the circumstances may vary as far as where you came from. Could be a stressful fight with your spouse or your child. And you may never calm down during that particular session. But what I do is I sit in a quiet room, usually in the morning, the morning you're gonna get the highest blood pressure you'll get all day long. Sit in a quiet room, comfortable temperature, feet on the floor, et cetera, no coffee. <laughs> coffee raises blood pressure. Even decaf coffee raises blood pressure. So uh, maybe it'll take you five minutes, maybe 10. But uh, you'll figure it out how long it takes to get yourself settled down. And you know, you, you should just check the pressure occasionally. If you're not on drugs, I would check it once a year, if you're healthy. If you're on medications, maybe maybe once a month, once you get your blood pressure stabilized. If you're in the process of making changes, like you're adding or subtracting drugs, or you're starting a new diet, then at most, I would check your blood pressure daily, once a day, not five times a day. Once a day is enough information for you and your doctor to have. And uh, you end up occupying too much of your day worrying about your blood pressure. You ruin the time you could be spending with your, with your friends, with your grandchildren. Don't get focused on these medical issues to the point where you ruin your life. Great. Thank you. There's a question about low blood pressure. When is it too low and is low blood pressure hereditary? It's too low if you're bleeding to death, <laughs> you know? I've uh, gotten a car accident and fluids are accumulating throughout your body. Yeah, that, then it's too low. It uh, is never too low if you're otherwise healthy. And as I mentioned to you, in, in healthy people, and I use the rural Africans as an example, uh, in the evening, you know, when, when they're sleeping, sometimes their blood pressure will go down to you know, like 60 or 70 over 40. Perfectly normal. Now, if you're dealing with medications, as I showed you, over-treatment increases your risk of stroke and heart attack because it decreases the perfusion pressures to your tissues. In that case, if you're going to need medication, you don't want to lower the blood pressure below, say, 140 to 150 at the top number, over maybe 80 to 90. 
the bottom number. If you lower it lower than that, you, you end up causing more harm than good. Uh, that's, that should be enough answer for that person. Okay. And I'm looking at, uh, blah, blah, blah. so how do you find Maybe your ideal? You had Pardon? mentioned that a, a person, once they achieve their trim body weight, that oh. often their blood pressure will begin to normalize, right? Well, well, that's, that's the, fun, you know, you could, what I, I guess the way I wanted to tell the story was, people get well really quickly. And I tell them within four months, the arthritis will be stopped. The balls will be working good. It takes about four months at most for the body to heal itself. However, that's not true when it comes to people who are very, very overweight. Being overweight uh, puts a burden on the body. And so on occasion, people have to wait until they hit trim body weight before they can declare themselves successful or declare themselves a failure. And uh, you know, that extra weight loss at say a rate of 10, 15 pounds a month, you're talking about too many people we know that have a year and a half's worth of body fat to lose or more. Somebody's asking, how does one determine their ideal body weight? Well, I think uh, a good way to do it is to take off your clothes and look in the mirror. If you're happy about it, that's probably okay. You can also use the Kempner charts uh, I have those in my November 2016 newsletter, Walter Kempner's charts, where he tells you based on your height, what you should weigh fully dressed. Maybe a little scary for some of you. Uh, you may think that uh, you may think that you'll never you'll never attain that body weight, but that's what a trim person weighs. You take a person who you take the bones and the muscles and the skin, and you don't have an accumulation of excess body fat. That's what they weigh. And uh, so I would use that chart, but uh, you know, if there, it, 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 what ideal body weight uh, often lies in the eyes of the beholder. You know, sometimes people praise a few extra pounds as, as being attractive and desirable. Other times, you know, being as stealth thin as possible, people admire, but you decide. I, you know, I, th I think trim is better. Uh, but the Walter Kemper charts will help. Okay, Mary, why don't you come over here and say hello to these folks. Okay. So Mary, Mary's here as, all, as always, you are kind enough to not only give me uh, an opportunity to, to do the new lectures I've developed, but also uh, we have a chance at the end of the session <clears throat> to have a, a practical part of this whole thing you know, not, not high intensity, not challenging and threatening like my presentations, but a nice friendly person to come and moderate things for you. <laughs> Hi, Mary. Nice to see you. Hi. Hi. Okay. Well, we have a still a few, a few more questions that are on right. this subject. And guys, now you can start asking questions for Mary as well. Noreen says, should people on ACE inhibitors not take NSAIDs and reduce potassium in their diets? I, I'd have to look it up. AJ, I mean, it's probably true. There are so many drug interactions. These drugs are, are so toxic that, uh, you know, you really have to be a, an expert in pharmacology to feel safe about taking them. So I would not be surprised if what she says has some truth that you'd find out when you looked up the prescribing information and the physician's test reference or on the internet. Okay. Well, you know, the goal should be to get off ACE inhibitors. That's what this whole lecture was about. You, you want to have to not worry about the interactions with other drugs and the side effects and so on and the costs. You want to get drug free. The only way you get drug free is to be healthy. The only way to be healthy for most of us is, 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 is to fix the food. And also, you, you know, drug free involves getting yourself uh, intermingled with medical people that believe in diet believe that the drug should be the last thing that you do. Not the first, but the last thing that you do as far as care goes. And, and that could be a chore for you. Unfortunately, most of my colleagues, and there's some very, very important exceptions, but most of my colleagues are involved in the education they got from the drug companies. And that's what they learned. 
I, that's what I learned in medical school 50 plus years ago. This will be 50 years. Actually, we're having our 50 year reunion in East Lansing, Michigan this fall. Wow. How many of you are left? Uh, you know, there, we, we had a small class. We started out with 28 people and two of them committed suicide and maybe three and Hi. Wow. Well, you know, it's a, being a medical doctor is uh, a high stress profession. And so you kind of collect people who, who do things like that to themselves anyway. We have had at least three suicides. We had one guy that was hit, hit by a train, another one hit by a car. Wow. A lot of the 28 people, there are probably 20 plus of us left 50 years later. It'd be nice to get together with them. I, I, uh, I know the last time I got together with him, I gave, um, I, I was the honorary speaker for the medical school in, in East Lansing, Michigan. And I went and I met a lot of my fellow students and they were so complimentary to me and I hopefully they will be this time. They said, you know, you don't look much different than you did when you went to medical school. <laughs> a little grayer. Of course, I found out Bill Maher dyes his hair. Last night on the Bill Maher show, he, he talked about dyeing his hair and I figured, heck, if I ever go back on the road again, I'm going to put some color in this guy. I'm going to look another 10 or 15 years younger. I could do that. That, that is incredible. 50 year medical school reunion. I hope you'll yeah. let us know how that goes. I look forward to it. We had a lot of fun in medical school with having a small class. We we're the first class that graduated from Michigan State University. We're one of the most respected medical schools in the country right now. And I think it was important for me to go to this medical school because it was new and they, uh, they, th they thought of themselves as being very progressive. Now they uh, weren't like the established medical school, Harvard, and Yale, et cetera, where they have a long tradition of everybody standing in line, being proper. I was a rebellious medical student. I almost got thrown out of medical school twice only because I, I did what I do now, which is challenge other people to you know, to the way they do things. And unfortunately, I challenged the wrong people a couple of times. And well, that was even before you started talking about food. Yeah, that was obviously, I've been this way for a <laughs> long time. And uh, anyway, thank goodness for Art Kelly. He saved me twice. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, are any of your professors still alive? I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I really, I really don't know. I, I know that the the head of the medical schools died and so was uh, Arthur Kelly. And uh, I, would, I would guess most of them because they're probably 10, 20 years older than I am and they'd be in their 80s and 90s have died. Maybe, maybe not, maybe there are a few around. I don't think the alcoholics made it, <laughs> a few of those. <laughs> wow, all right, so here's a question from Ellen. She says she took your 10 day program in uh, 2013 and has eaten your way oil-free since then. And she wants to know, is it possible that anxiety can push up a person's blood pressure? Yes. Yeah. But that's, that's one of the, that was the first drawing that I showed you. And that is with excitement or pain or, you know, anxiety. Yes. Your blood pressure will go up. It's called white coat syndrome. And that's why you don't, you don't value the blood pressures when you go into a doctor's office because what you're doing is you're measuring how frightened the physician and the circumstances make you. That's why you check your blood pressure at home. So yeah, I can very well. And th there are ways of getting around that that may help. They have uh, 24 hour monitors. And these days with your iPhone, I mean, they're very simple to use. And what these, uh, these uh, uh, instrumentations do is they, is they measure your blood pressure, say every few minutes or every hour, and then they record the values and <clears throat> you can see what happened over a whole day. So it's called ambulatory blood pressure mon monitoring and you may wanna do that. But then again, you just might wanna eat good, walk around, get a little sunshine and get well. Do you have to wear something for that? You do, yeah, oh. wear a little, little cuff. They have uh, even more invasive ways of doing it, but I wouldn't, I'm not familiar with them, so I wouldn't talk about them. Okay, so this question from Leslie leads me to believe she would be the perfect candidate for your next virtual McDougal program. She says, I was just put on rovastatin and losartan. I was plant-based for many years and my cardiologist said, it isn't working with my family history. 
Mm-hmm. I was 160 over 78. Cholesterol was 189 with the statin. She put me on drugs and wants me to eat fish. My cardiac risk score is off the charts at 600. How can I control my health? Well, uh, it's not the way I take care of my patients. You know, first of all, I believe that my patients are healthy people. I also believe that they're intelligent and they like themselves. Most of the medical profession thinks people, our customers are stupid. They're barely smart enough to take the pills we prescribe for them. They're barely smart enough to sign the check at the end of the office visit. That's the way we're taught to think about our customers. So if that's how the doctor's thinking about you and it sounds like he or she is, that's not the way you wanna be supervised and helped. You wanna be helped by somebody who looks at you as a healthy person. You're just doing something wrong. Now, I wouldn't treat a blood pressure, uh, cholesterol of 180 some with statin drugs unless there was something else going on. And I certainly wouldn't use Losartan, which is an angiotensin receptor blocker to treat blood pressure. Anyway, uh, yeah, you know, like you say, she'd be ideal for the, the 12 day program we run now. And we do everything we could to get her off the medication during that 12 days. But we follow up with people for an entire year as part of the program. So what we weren't able to accomplish in 12 days, we've got 12 months to work with you and to get these things accomplished. We just need willing people is what we need. If you're interested in being well, if you're interested in getting out of the medical business, you're interested in getting off the drugs because there's side effects and costs, we're the right people for you. That's, that's our whole goal. Is to, you know, you're a healthy person. You're just not expressing that. We're going to help you express your good health. But what do you think about the statement from the cardiologist that uh, a plant-based diet doesn't work with your family history? Again, the, you know, ig- ignor- ig- ignorance is profound in the medical profession. <laughs> he knows nothing about diet. I know he knows nothing about diet because uh, it's not taught in medical schools. They teach you biochemical formulas. They don't teach diet therapy. You may recall, I've talked about this many times and I won't discuss it in any detail again, but in the year 2011 in the state of California, I wrote a law and got it passed. It was called SB 380, you can look it up. SB 380 would force doctors to learn about what human beings eat, that's all. Uh, I presented the information to the Senate committee in early part of 2011. It was voted on by both houses and passed unanimously. And it was signed into law by Jerry Brown, our governor, in September of 2011. But the the medical board of California found ways to get around it. I don't want to go through that misery. I just worked too hard to even bring up the topic. But your doctor knows nothing about diet therapy. So you know, just because he or she has a, a degree in whatever, doesn't mean that they're educated properly. And think about it, there, 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 there are populations of people who had no heart disease prior to World War II, no breast cancer prior to World War II. Now, we, we, within our memory, we have uh, people in the millions that didn't become obese, who didn't take all these drugs, who are hardworking, fighting people who lived on starch-based diets, like rice. So, um, you know, if, if a whole population of a billion people can avoid high cholesterol and high blood pressure, then I certainly think the statement that your family history sets you up to be a failure is wrong, profoundly wrong. Maybe a little more difficult for you because your family tendencies, but <clears throat> it's not your genetics. It's, it's what you eat. Yep, thank you. Uh, Pat says, Dr. McDougall, is there a way to get the reference about what minimum measurement should be treated for seniors and to what blood pressure measurement? Well, you could, or you could replay this video I just did. I, I'm pretty careful about putting the scientific references on the slides. And when we talk about the U or J-shaped curve of mortality, and I gave you two examples. I gave you at least five scientific references on these slides. 
And you can just go to Google, you put in the reference and almost always uh, the reference comes up and it's accessible for you. It's open access and you can read the whole paper or you could just start with your original research. You could put in U shape or J shape curve of mortality and high blood pressure and dozens of articles will be spit back at you which all show the same thing. Oh, except for the ones where the spin doctors from the drug companies got involved. No, they discredit all this uh, science so they can sell the drugs. You know, if, if the idea that more drugs are bad, well, that's how they make money, selling more drugs. What do you think they're gonna do? Just business. Nobody hates you. It's not a conspiracy. They just want the money. Anyway, I, this is not a controversial topic, uh, U-shape or J-shape curve of mortality. Something I've known about for over 30 years. And the references I gave you are all within the last couple of years. Great. That makes sense, doesn't it? You know, the pressure goes up because the system is all clogged up and you're trying to deliver nutrients to the, to the vital organs. And you introduce a drug which decreases perfusion pressure, what would you expect to happen? Thank you. This is a question from John, and he wants to know if eating natural sweets like dates or eating too many would have any effect on blood pressure. Just good, just good effects. In other words, you're getting calories that uh, don't have the artery damaging properties like saturated fat and cholesterol. You'd be eating food that has dietary fiber and carbohydrates, which are kind to the arteries. So I can think of nothing but positive things that would happen. Now, dates are very high calorie and calories count. So if you're trying to lose weight, you don't want to put dates as a dominant part of your diet. That's a lot of sugar, a lot of calories. And you'll have to go back and review the lecture I gave on obesity to understand that the body does not convert sugar into fat with any efficiency. But if you're gonna eat sugar, the body's gonna leave your body fat where it is. It's not gonna burn it because it prefers to burn sugar. It's called glycolysis. You learned about it in high school biology. The cells burn sugar. <laughs> ah, when I say sugar, you know, I mean potatoes and sweet potatoes and rice and corn. But, you know, table sugar has been given a bad rap. It's not health food. Rots your teeth, raises triglycerides, it's empty calories, it spares the fat that's on your body and so you don't lose weight as easily. It's not health food. But it's not the demon that it's been played out to be. And the reason you're not getting well is you're, you're following false gods, bad information based upon beliefs, not science, based upon you know, wishes. I, I, wanna, I wanna hear good news about my bad habits. So I have to like pork chops. So I'm gonna to get all the research I can find that says eating pork chops is good for me. That's human nature. But I, uh, teach and do the things that I do and I have for the past nearly half a century because my patients get good results. I'm the luckiest doctor in the world. I don't have to offer bags full of pills and dozens of excuses to you as to why you're sick. I can, I can help you get well. Can you imagine how good that makes me feel? I mean, think about it. Think about how happy I am as a doctor because my efforts result in helping other people. Yep. Thank you. So this is from Dawn. I've had three heart cath ablations and now have some flutter. I'm on is, lis, lisinopril and lisinopril. That's an ACE inhibitor. And, and so, so tall, which is an antiarrhythmic med because okay. I also have tachycardia. It's very short, but I have it a couple times a day for several seconds. I did lose 40 pounds, went plant-based, but still had tachycardia on lisinopril 10 milligrams. Right. Well, you know, he's, a, he's in a, a desperate situation and hopefully the drugs will help him not have the arrhythmias. And the conditioning he is likely talking about is called atrial fibrillation. 
quite a common condition. It's due to eating the Western diet. What happens you eat the Western diet and you plug up the tiny blood vessels in the heart, the blood vessels that supply the nervous system of the heart. And as a result, you develop this, this uh, arrhythmia where the atrium beats 300 times a minute. It's called atrial fibrillation. And you know, when you get into that kind of illness, uh, sometimes you're, you're left with problems because it's not reversible. And you can eat potatoes until they're coming out of your ears and you're not gonna reverse the condition of atrial fibrillation, the damage is done. So uh, if you're continuing to have arrhythmias, uh, you could take antiarrhythmic drugs with hope that they'll make you more comfortable. But often these antiarrhythmic drugs they increase your risk of dying. So you need to explore that also. How troublesome are the arrhythmias? Uh, so troublesome that I would take a drug that increases my risk of dying. And you don't, you need that information. You can sort it out. You have a computer. The internet is powerful. Look it up. So atrial fibrillation wouldn't kill you? Uh, no, it's no. It's just it, uncomfortable yeah, feeling. Right. right. Your, your, was your dad had AFib? My mother had your atrial fibrillation. Yeah. She had it for 20 years. The, the heart function is decreased by about 25% when the atrium isn't beaten in, in, synch in synchrony with the ventricles. So you get a, a reduction in heart function by about 25%, which is not a big deal unless you're trying to run a race. So you live you're perfectly fine. The next thing you have to deal with is that people who have atrial fibrillation are more likely to form blood clots in the atrium because it's a fluttering like a bag of worms and the blood doesn't flow out of it very easily. And so particularly when you're on the Western diet, you form blood clots, which embolize to the brain and it results in stroke. About 3% of people a year who have atrial fib develop some type of cerebral vascular accident. So you're treated with blood thinning drugs. It used to be Coumadin and now it's uh, Eliquis or other blood thinning modern medications you're treated with. And that re reduces the risk of these clots going to the brain. This is proper standard medicine. Do I use it? Yeah, a little bit, but I use it carefully. I only give people who are going to benefit this kind of therapy and healthy people don't benefit. At least when we weigh the harms and risks for the benefits, you find out that healthy people, they don't need it. And so my patients with atrial fibrillation are generally healthy. And so they don't fit the standard criteria, which you can look up. You look it up, it's called the CHADS, C-H-A-D-S, C-H-A-D-S, the CHADS, chart that helps you figure out whether you would benefit from taking these blood thinners or not. And I have to say by reflex, uh, almost all doctors that I've come in contact with, they put people on blood thinning drugs if they have atrial fib. They don't bother looking at the research that determines whether or not you'll receive more, more benefit than harm. And you, will, you can look that up yourself. It's called the CHAD score, C-H-A-D-S. Great. This question can be answered by both of you. Nutritional yeast, good or bad? Well, not, it's I'm good because it adds flavor. And um, you can add it to popcorn because it's sort of a flake, so it will stick to the, the dry popcorn. Um, I use it to add flavor, more like a cheesy flavor to things. So um, I think it's good. Do you have a favorite brand? I have uh, Bragg's in my, in my cupboard right now that I like. Do you like the taste of it, Dr. McDougal? You know, I just eat the food. I don't ask her what's in it. <laughs> yeah, but you, there's, you, there's a few things I remember you don't like, like eggplant. I, I don't like eggplant. Yeah, that's right. He, he, eats, he eats things that I put nutritional yeast into, so I guess he likes it okay. Yeah. Great. I don't use a lot of it, but I almost always have a jar of it in my cupboard. Nice. What Dana asks, what is the most accurate blood pressure monitor or device for one to use at home? I, I couldn't tell you that, you know, you, there you can go to the internet and you can look up reviews of uh, blood pressure cuffs, automatic blood pressure machines. You could see what I did, did as I looked up, I went to Amazon and I looked at various machines that were sold on Amazon. Generally they carry some pretty good products. You know, Amazon does. And 
the cost of these machines, these automatic monitors, which you can use easily at home and are quite accurate. The wrist ones are not very accurate. So you wanna get a cuff that fits around the, the top of the arm. Cost between 25 and $75. Now, you know, I, I have lived my life with a philosophy and that is a good whiskey is determined by the price you charge for it because it all tastes the same. <laughs> So I, I often buy things with that idea. I can't figure out which is the best. And even though I've looked at the reviews, I usually pick the one that costs more. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Yeah, assuming, assuming that the, the price reflects the quality. That I realize this is not always the case, but what else am I going to use? Great. Thank you. Uh, I just saw a question here. Where did it go? I would also add to that, that um, when you're looking up the reviews, find one that people review as easy to use, easy to put on your arm. And, um, and actually you have to send them, they'll tell you when you get it, you have to send them back every year or two to have them um, professionally calibrated to make sure they're measuring accurately. Thank you. Um, Steve says, can medications, for example, the pills I take for toenail fungus, slowly and surely cause in high blood pressure? Not that I'm aware of, but then again, there are lots of things that I don't know. You might want to look that up on the internet. Um, I can't think of any, any, any connection now between toenail fungus medicine and blood pressure. Okay, thank you. This is from Gary. Does Dr. McDougall have any thoughts about alpha blockers for hypertension? Yeah, they're, they're, not, they're not used. Uh, alpha, alpha adrenergic uh, blockers, that's another class. They're not used very commonly. And uh, they're used often to treat prostatism uh, because uh, what, what they're like, it's called Flomax is one of them. What the many most commonly is prescribed for is men who have difficulty urinating and you take the alpha adrenergic blockers and somehow that relaxes the the muscles around your urethra and allows the passage of urine a little easier but it's not used as a blood pressure medication very often the only blood pressure medication that has been thoroughly tested to reduce your risk of heart failure and strokes is chlorothalidone the rest of them lower blood pressure, but as far as other outcomes go, you know, the testing of them has been very sparse. And whether or not a medication gets uh, approved to be sold as an antihypertensive depends upon whether it lowers blood pressure or not. Even if it may increase your risk of dying like it does in angiotensin receptor blockers. Even though it increases your risk of dying of heart disease by 60%, they don't care, it still lowers blood pressure. And so it's sold to you and your doctors as an anti-hypertensive medication. Well, good grief, the reason you're concerned about your blood pressure is you don't wanna die of heart disease. Why would you take a drug that increases your risk of dying of heart disease? Makes no sense. And that's why I explained to you, there are two classes of drugs I don't use ever. And I almost always can get away with just a little bit of chlorothalidone. I don't have to even bother with the other medications. Well, you're on chlorothalidone or any diuretic, you don't have to be concerned about the loss of potassium. But otherwise, they're relatively safe. Powerful, too. Chlorothalidone is much more powerful than hydrochlorothiazide. And as I mentioned, if you want to look at the endpoints that you really are concerned about, like strokes and congestive heart failure, then you find that chlorothalidone wins out every time over hydrochlorothiazide. That's a generic drug, right? Yeah, it is. It costs like you get 90 pills at Walmart for 10 bucks. Great. You wonder why it's not used? Oh, well, <laughs> we don't have any uh, pretty young ladies coming into the office with donuts and pizza for our office staff. And of course, the male doctors, they don't mind a little entertainment by having a scantily dressed high school ex cheerleader come in and entertain them for an hour or two. Well, she's there to sell the most expensive drugs that this company makes, not the cheap ones that they make no profit off of. Why do you think you, you get the prescriptions that you get? It's not because it's in your best interest. It's what has 
currently being sold through all kinds of high pressure techniques to your doctor by the drug companies. They pay for dinners, they pay for theater tickets. They, and they send these beautiful young women in to see you. <laughs> I still remember that. Even at 75 years old, I still remember, Mary. <laughs> You never, for, got, for, you never got any after a long time. Yeah, you know, they, they stopped sending me their, their entertainment after a while. They figured out I don't write drugs. And so it was only <laughs> in my very early years when I had that kind of entertainment. And I was fortunate to be married to, to somebody that could well entertain me. I didn't have to have any <laughs> artificial entertainment. <laughs> Great. Uh, Mary yeah. asks... In your book, The Healthiest Diet on the Planet, there's at least one recipe that contains sesame oil. Does that mean sesame oil is okay? Sesame oil is only, the only, only time I use sesame oil is a little drip at a time for seasoning. I don't use a, a big glob of it to saute anything in. It's just for flavor. So it can easily be left out, but... Um, it's not, if you notice, even in the recipe, I don't tell you to saute the vegetables in sesame oil. I, I tell you to add a little drop at the end for flavor. Okay, thanks. TS asks, I noticed a new class on your website titled Maximum Weight Loss Class. It's not the certification class. Can you discuss what that class teaches? You know, I, I, I wish I could give you a complete explanation of it but we just started teaching it. It's abbreviated in the terms of time and cost. And it's focused uh, on weight loss. And there are a couple lectures that I give. Uh, there's a lot of support from our team, but I believe it does not care, uh, include medical care. And it's a way to get to more people inexpensively, very effective uh, teaching tool. But uh, I, I'm not familiar enough with it to tell you anything more than that. But if you had Heather on, you know, our daughter who runs and owns the company, she could give you a, a, a thorough explanation as to what they're doing. They're trying to, I, I've always been focused on just taking care of my patients. And so I've always tried to just develop a medical setting. And Heather, she has a much broader outlook on what this business ought to be. And so she's interested in, in helping all kinds of people at all different levels of health and interest and financial uh, opportunities. And you know, she's really expanded the business. And it really has, I have to tell you, AJ, I was impressed a couple of days ago. I don't do this very often, but I put my name into the internet and whoa, and we have a lot of exposure. And that's as a result of uh, me retiring <laughs> and Heather, Heather taking over the business. And you know, the young people, they know how to work the internet. They know how to work devices and social media. And, ah, uh, you know, you can't teach me that stuff. So fortunately, she's, uh, she's added so much to the business. And she's relatively old, too. She's uh, almost 50. Wow. Yeah, but she knows how to run the Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of information on the McDougal program on Instagram. And you could probably go there and ask just a question, they have places where you can ask a question or make a comment and ask what, you know, if anyone's taken the maximum weight loss course and what it involves and you get an answer from the people on Instagram that, that run our Instagram page. Well, Heather is booked on the show on the 26th of this month. Oh. All right, there you go. So she'll be able to answer those questions. Uh, Peter says, how do you feel about polishing a pan dry with a minuscule amount of oil to help the pancakes not stick? There are non-stick pancake riddles, by the way. There are. And, you know, what I found is that um, the best ones are ones that have not been seasoned with oil. Once you start putting oil onto the, the, um, the texture of a non-stick pan, it just ruins the non-stick ability. So if you start by what, what they used to call seasoning the pan with some oil and then wiping it out, it, it, it eventually over time, it ruins the nonstick um, function of the pan so it doesn't work as well. So I don't use it, I don't recommend it. Right. I just buy good nonstick cookware. And there's a lot of them out there. 
Yep. Dr. McDougal, there's a lot of questions on colonoscopies and bloating. Maybe the next time you come back, you could do some GI stuff. Well, I could. I could do the GI or I also, there's a lecture on uh, screening early detection that I'd like to give this group sometime. It's about mammograms and colonoscopies and you know, what, what screening techniques should you avail yourself to? Because you know, this is a big racket. This is the ultimate in disease mongering. Disease mongering is tur turning people into patients, which is what any good business would do. I mean, we're just doing business, folks. So what you do is you get people frightened. You tell them if you join your screening program, we'll find the disease early enough to make a difference. True or not, they've captured you. So maybe I'll do a lecture sometime soon on, on screening and uh, what's worth your while and what's not. I, I recommend two screenings, o only two, and they are pap smears for sexually active women done every three to five years until they're 50. And I recommend uh, colon exams using either stools, you can check the Cologuard with the genetic material or just for blood. And, or you can have one sigmoid exam at age 60. I recommend against colonoscopies, it's too dangerous. What about the virtual? Don't they have a virtual they colonoscopy? Do. They do that. It's where you take an x-ray uh, and then you're exposed to uh, oh, as much okay. as 10,000 <laughs> chest <laughs> x-rays. Uh, I think I think the, the stool is, is a good way to go across for the complete testing, somewhere between three and four, forty, three and forty dollars it costs. A sigmoid exam, which is done in the doctor's office without anesthesia, is about two hundred dollars. Relatively painless, virtually no adverse effects, no risks, as opposed to a colonoscopy, which is done in a surgical center or a hospital, under sedation or anesthesia, with a lot of risks. At $3,000 an exam. I, I just to entice you about uh, the lecture on early detection is what I want you to consider is that you are risking your life today. Okay, you have a colonoscopy, you're risking your life today by the theoretical benefit that you're going to have less risk of dying of colon cancer 10, 20, or 30 years from now. Do you want to take that bet? I certainly don't recommend it. Anyway, for those of you who can't wait, there are two, two lectures on call or two papers I've written on cold and mosque me on the website. You can look it up. One is August 2010, the other I wrote in 2017. And they go into all the details about colonoscopy. Yeah, you know, interesting. When I published the one in 2010, I was working with a lot of gastroenterologists. And I actually gave their responses in the next newsletter about what they thought about my August 2010 uh, article on colonoscopies, a gold standard to refuse is what it was called. And so I, I encouraged gastroenterologists to respond back to me and tell me why I was wrong. And you can read their responses in the next month's newsletter. Didn't have much to say. Certainly not enough to say that would discourage from the Canadian Task Force on Preventive Medicine, telling Canadian citizens that they should not get a colonoscopy done as of 2016. All European countries that I'm aware of do not recommend colonoscopies for their citizens. It's only the US and a few other countries that do, and it's based on making money. Well, there's a lot of tests that are for early detection, so maybe you should do a a whole time. I, I, I will. I'll do that. I'll, you know, maybe I'll do that next time. I don't know. Keep your guess. <laughs> uh, depends on. Dep I don't. I don't know. It depends on what you folks would like to hear about. You can always write me at Dr. McDougal at drmcdougal.com and tell, tell me what you're thinking. And it would be easier for me to put together a presentation knowing that you'd be interested in the subject. There are a few other things I have to talk about, but boy, have I covered a large amount of information, thanks to you, AJ. A whole lecture on breast cancer, a whole lecture on how diet affects uh, hormones and precocious puberty and menopause, a whole lecture on heart disease, one on autoimmune diseases. And we talked about that a couple of days ago 
because uh, Will Smith's wife has an autoimmune disease called alopecia. And Will Smith made it a, 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 a uh, illness heard around the world when he slapped Chris Rock in, at the Oscars. You know that. I mean, that's all everybody's talking about. So what we did is we put out that lecture that we did on Chef AJ's show on what causes autoimmune diseases. And it got like 65,000 hits right after the mailing went out. And so I try and do things that are, are timely and relevant to you and also do them with the idea that when you come to see us at our 12 day internet program, which we encourage pretty much everybody to do. I mean, it's, it's an amazing 12 day experience for a relatively inexpensive price. I wanna make sure you walk away with all the education you need. So I put these lectures together and if you come with breast cancer, I'm gonna have you sit down and watch the breast cancer lecture. You got diabetes, you spend an hour with the diabetes lecture. You got autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. You sit down for that hour. And now with the high blood pressure, if you have high blood pressure, which you know, a good 20 to 40% of people have, <clears throat> you sit on, sit on, watch this, yeah, watch, watch this lecture that, I, that I, I had the opportunity to give. Um, and again, I, I appreciate the the audience and it's much better than for me to give the lecture and knowing you're watching and listening and developing questions <laughs> rather than just talking to the computer. I know what you mean. It is hard. It's harder when, when nobody's there yeah. looking. Well, yeah, yes it is. And uh, I certainly remember the days when I used to do a live audience presentation and that was just completely different. And I, I would look forward to doing that again. That's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of personal positive feedback. And of course you see the late night talk show hosts so glad that they finally have an audience back and they can really perform now, whereas it's, it's hard for a, an educator or an entertainer to, to work to blank walls. I agree, I agree. So Sandy says, my husband has SCAD, spontaneous coronary artery dissection. He, has, he had his heart attack last year. He takes metoprotol, can he ever get off the medication? The cardiologist says never. Well, as I say, once you're on these drugs, the drug companies have taught us that you never get off. Uh, it's a beta blocker that he's on. And the idea being that he has the dissection of the artery caused by pressure. Not so. The dissection occurred because the arteries became diseased because of the way he's eaten for so many years, the pressure had little or nothing to do with it. If you go back and review what I shared with you, you will raise the pressure to 3000 millimeters of mercury before you cause any rupture in the arteries. I've given you the data, I've showed you the study. So it's not the pressure and that's why he's gonna get very little benefit from being on a beta blocker, which reduces the pressure. If you wanna keep the arteries from failing, you must fix the problem. It's the food. Atherosclerosis is reversible. The arteries will heal. In fact, they're trying to heal right now for all of you, all of us. Your body's trying to heal. It's constantly trying to heal. It's just that uh, the damage outstrips the ability of the body to heal. Get control of the fork and spoon and you'll see the healing going on. So if I was taking care of your husband, I would likely put him on a very strict diet. Shouldn't surprise you. I'd keep on the beta blocker because that, because I'd get less less criticism for than taking them off. That's probably why I would. And uh, I would probably give him some statin drugs too, because he's already declared the fact that, uh, you know, that it's a diet. And even though the studies on using statin drugs to prevent heart attacks are show very weak benefits. In fact, so weak that you can't see the benefit and people who haven't had previous heart attacks. You, you can only see the benefits of using statin drugs in people who have already had a heart attack or a stroke. You gotta look at really sick people because the benefits from these drugs are so tiny. You can't see it in healthy people. You have to, to look at sick people and, and the benefits are really, really tiny. The drugs, the benefits are very tiny. But, you know, they're reasonable. And besides that, I don't want to be criticized by my colleagues and 
certainly I don't want to go to a, to a malpractice lawsuit. So I'm going to protect myself a little bit, but I'm certainly not going to protect myself to the point where I allow one of my patients to be harmed. If I thought the beta blocker was doing the patient harm, I would take them off it for sure. I just don't think it's doing any good. It's not the problem. The problem's not the blood pressure. Uh, if you just haven't, if you haven't understood what I believe, then you spend another 45 minutes listening to the lecture I just gave. You know, I, I think I did a pretty thorough, pretty good job. And I think I conveyed to you what the problems are and what the solutions are. So you got the lecture, it's free. You can watch it a thousand times. You can show it to your doctor. You know, take the lectures I've done, the books that I've written, the articles I've written, show them to your physician and say, this is the way I want to be treated. Tell me why this is wrong. Tell me why you're not treating me this way. I mean, if you like what we do, then, you know, instead of coming to us, why don't you get that kind of care from your physician? I'll tell you why you don't do it. Because you're not going to get the care. What the doctor's going to say is, oh, that's interesting. Next. <laughs> and seven minutes later walks in another customer who doesn't put up a stink and doesn't ask all these questions. And you just shove the money in your pocket and in the bank. That's what we do. Just like every other person on this earth. It's money. Yep. Okay. Here, I got a question. I got a couple more. Mm, but where did it go? Oh, uh, this is from... Johnny, does Dr. McDougall have any recommendations concerning nitric oxide? Uh, Colin Campbell talks a lot about nitrous oxide and how it helps the arteries stay healthy. <clears throat> you know, for me, I don't need to know this detail. You know, I, I know, I know that the foods uh, that I recommend you eat result in high, high nitrous oxide levels in your arteries and make your arteries most healthy. No, how, how would you measure that? Uh, I don't know. They, uh, they probably have some kind of tests. Oh, okay. I, I, I don't really know. I think there's some sticks. You know, I actually had Dr. Nathan Bryan on last week is supposedly the world's leading expert on that. And there's some test sticks you can taste. Test. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's become popular. I'm sorry, Mary. I don't know. Uh, but I could look it up. <laughs> I mean, I could look it up on the internet. So anyway, uh, I know what you should be doing to fix the problems. You need to change the food to a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables and get off the drugs and get a little sunshine and go for a walk. I, I know that's what you need to do. I don't need the details. Some of you do and some of you learn the details because it's a way of selling your products, selling your supplements that raise nitrous oxide levels. Ah, you don't want to do that. You want to do it with food. Yep. Are routine dental x-rays okay? Oh, now you're getting uh, really outside my field. I'm a medical doctor, not a dental doctor. But if you want to know what I do, I don't get routine dental x-rays. Nobody in my family does. Why? Well, I'm afraid they're going to find something. And the x-ray machine is the, the biggest draw to medical practice that's ever been invented. In other words, you're, you're, you're disease mongering. You're turning people into patients with this x-ray machine. They always find something, don't they? A little cavity over here, a little something over there. All right, well, you know, you, you've, gotta, you've gotta show that all this investigation results in a better life. And I don't think that's the case. Uh, if you have a bad cavity, it'll hurt. It'll be obvious. You don't need to be poking around with x-rays. I realize there are some exceptions to what I had to say, but in general, I think that the x-ray machines in most dental offices are a way to really make profits. That's what I think. Okay, great. Uh, is popcorn okay? Yeah, if you don't put oil and butter on it. If you just put air pop popcorn. And then, like I said, you can put some nutritional yeast on it. Or when my boys were little, they used to spray Bragg's liquid aminos on it very lightly, make it a little salty flavor, and uh, it's great. Good. Okay, here's 
Mary says, says doctor, what does Dr. McDougal think about getting ALA fatty acid instead of DHA EPA fatty acid? Should we go to seaweed to get the DHA EPA or is ALA good enough? People always are worried about this omega thing and fish oil. and Right. Well, the reason is, is because a lot of people out there selling fish oil supplements. Your essential amino acid is alpha-linolenic acid, alpha-linolenic acid. That's made by plants. Only plants make that. There's also a uh, linoleic acid, which is made by plants too. Linolenic acid. Pardon me, I'm getting to the words a little <laughs> confused. Anyway, uh, the original source of DHA and EPA, in other words, icosapentaenoic acid, the original source is plants. There no, no animal, no fish can can make omega-3 fats. We don't have the, the enzymes that allow us to desaturate at the, at the carbon-3 position. Only plants can do that. So the original source of all essential fatty acids is plants. And if you eat enough plants, which you're gonna be able to do, you're gonna make all the EPA and all the DHA you need. And I've looked into the arguments that try and convince people they need to add fish to their diet because the human being is not able to make as much DHA as they need from essential fats that are made by plants. That's not true. It's not true. It's, it, uh, the research says it's not true. I actually wrote that research in the Start Solution book, but you can investigate it. You can look up on the internet, the various studies, and you could use the things that I've written as a, a place to start to read the references. But if it were true, you had to have fish fat to have a healthy brain, et cetera, then there'd be nobody living away from the water. The, the, you know, populations that existed that didn't have a source of seafood wouldn't exist. Terrestrial populations would not exist. So obviously they do. <laughs> In fact, probably most of the people that ever lived on earth didn't live seaside. They weren't fishermen, they didn't eat fish and boy, oh boy, they seem to do okay. Anyway, it's made by plants. Plants make all the essential fats. They make all the essential amino acids. They make vitamins. 11 of the 13 known vitamins are made by plants. It's a conspiracy. Plants are <laughs> trying to work their way in your life. Yeah, come on you guys. Okay, thank you. Is chlorothiodone a prescribed medication or yes. over the counter? No, you have to get it by your doctor's prescription. And likely your doctor you know, will hesitate. Shouldn't, especially if you present some research that says this is how you'd like to be treated. Or you can show the doctor the presentation I just gave. The doctor can look up the papers himself. I guess I put the references there for you on the slides. No, it's a, a doctor prescribed. Doctors are not used to prescribing chlorothaladone. It, this came out in the late 1950s and quickly it was replaced by a brand name drug called hydrochlorothiazide. And uh, as, as the new drugs came out, the brand name, the high profit, the, the older drugs were relegated to the past. Doctors were discouraged. They were actively discouraged from prescribing these generic medications. They have spin doctors that work for the drug companies that, that take and publish papers, quote, scientific, which degrade the past treatments and encourage the doctors to prescribe the brand new top of the line, high tech pill that we sell instead of like 90 pills for $10, we sell $90 a pill. It's just business, get over it. Nobody's out to get you. It's just they're trying to make money. Sound like something you know about in your business? Yep. Okay. This is from Kama. I am following your program and not losing weight as fast as suggested. I've lost 45 pounds since last May. Well, you tell them why they haven't been losing the weight as fast as they'd like, JJ, you know. Well, you once told me that one of your mentors, Dr. Walter Kempner, said all dieters are liars. 
I did <laughs> say that. I just, but I <laughs> thought you had the <laughs> He said that too. Well, I would just say that it really comes down to calorie density. And so is this person eating out? Uh, because then you're getting oil, whether you know it or not. And, you know, sometimes you just got to tweak that starch to veggie ratio just a little tiny bit, just a little bit. Never skip yes. on starch, stay but away, just stay from the well, stay away from the nuts and avocados and coconut and things like that. High yeah. fat plant foods. I, I think that, 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 that what you mentioned, AJ, that those are the things that you have to stop eating out. You have to you have to do what we tell you to do. And uh, nuts and seeds and avocados and fake foods are often the downfalls of people who eat vegetarian diets. I mean, think about it for a minute. Prior to 1980, there were 2 billion Asians. China, Japan, Thailand, Vietnam. Nobody was overweight. You know, the, the, the effects of a, a healthy diet are so profound that you can't escape what I just told you. The, the only overweight people I can think of in Asian countries would be the sumo wrestlers in Japan. They eat a special diet full of fat. Anyway, <laughs> it always works, okay? None of you get calories from the air or from water. It just doesn't happen. The law of thermodynamics says that if you're gonna change the weight, you have to change the ratio of calories in versus calories out. And some calories are particularly fattening. Those are the fats and oils, because they're so efficiently stored. The fat you eat, the fat you wear. Carbohydrate calories, not very efficiently stored because it takes a lot of work to change a sugar into a fat. The body doesn't want to do that. So it burns extra carbohydrate off as heat. I think that was the last set of lectures we did was on obesity, wasn't it, AJ? Yeah, they're all there, taking an hour to go through that whole thing. <laughs> uh, but, um, I, I showed you uh, skinny people. I did a whole video for you in that lecture on skinny people. And I, I showed you populations that probably amount to two or three billion people. And nobody, nobody is overweight. You want to hear something interesting? So I like, I mean, to me, restaurants are a punishment. And I, I mean, luckily the pandemic, I haven't had to eat in one. And even before that, I maybe ate at a restaurant once a year where there's a gun to my head. But I learned that, you know how sometimes restaurants have their nutritional information available online, or if you ask for it, well, they'll put the number of calories in, you know what I'm talking about, right? Well, it, they don't have to say how much oil. So in other words, let's say they have a stir fry on the menu. They don't have to put in that the amount of oil they're using to cook it. They only put the amount of calories and fat in the ingredients in the recipe, mm -hmm. not in the oil. So that means whatever you're thinking, it's going to be way more oil and way more fat mm -hmm. because restaurants really don't know how to not use oil. No, they sure don't. No, they sure right, don't. In, in, in um, culinary school, they never teach future chefs how to bake or <laughs> cook or anything without oil or some kind of fat. And, uh, I can attest to that. Boy, yeah. we eat so much coconut oil and agave. Yeah. It was just like, oh my God. It's like, that's where you, that's crazy, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. So, so since, we, since we got together last time, we had an experience at eating out. Uh, we went to Hood River with uh, our son and his family. And there was a Japanese restaurant in Hood River, or we're talking about Oregon. The Japanese restaurant that used to, we used to be able to order without any trouble at all, as we can in almost every Japanese restaurant, very oil-free food. Well, they it changed the ownership since the last time we were there and it became a noodle place. And even though we asked them to cook it without oil, for the six of us, it cost me $170 for a pile of grease I wouldn't eat. You know, I felt cheap, $170 for grease. I'll never go back there again. Eating out is a terrible experience. <laughs> I agree. I, I, I think it's terrible. Uh, Steve wants to know if Medicare will or do foresee a time where they might pay for any part of your 12-day program. 
Yeah, they, they could and they would if we apply for it right now because we have research that backs up our program. Uh, the Ornish program, uh, they are involved with Medicare and so uh, is the Pritikin program in California. Uh, if you wanna go through a program that takes advantage of government intervention, because they do, then uh, I would say go to the Ornish program. You get really good care. But I don't want to be involved with uh, with the the government in terms of our relationship, and we charge a reasonable enough price that I don't need to have Medicare substitutions or help uh, for you to come and learn. In fact, we take it another step further, and that is if you go to the website drmcdougall.com, you'll find the entire program there for free. If you, if you were willing to take the trouble to do it, it's all laid out in 62 pages of discussion, free. There are probably 2000 recipes available for you for free. So you wanna do one better than worrying about whether or not Medicare is gonna help pay for you to come to our program. Well, you got the Ornish program, which I would, would not discourage you from going to. And you have our website, which is, I think a pretty good deal. But most people need a little extra help and medical care is really important, especially when you're dealing with somebody on medication, you need some help getting off these drugs. And well, wasn't uh, there something about um, the health savings program that you could apply for um, part of the uh, cost uh, if you have a health savings yeah. HS? I don't know whether we take it or not, but yeah, there are there, some. There was, there was something like that. I, don't, I remember it used to be on our old website. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We did, we did have something up there. Yeah, but you'll have to look into it. It's not part of our business. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Uh, but um, um, where where did it go? I just saw a question. Well, people are saying, you know, when you had mentioned not to have a colonoscopy, but what if you have a history of polyps? Well, then you ought to change what's causing the polyps, which is the food. The food is irritating to the mucosa of the colon. It causes the mucosal cells to proliferate because of the irritation. You know, just like if you keep scratching your hand, the skin cells, will, they'll make keratin. They'll proliferate and make keratin. If you scratch mucous membranes, what happens is they proliferate into lumps that are called polyps. Polyps only exist in populations that eat the Western diet. Somewhere around 30 to 40% of people who don't know they have polyps have polyps who eat the Western diet. But it's non-existent. Uh, there's evidence um, that says that if you stop eating the irritating foods, the polyps will disappear. I'll go into that evidence if you want, but you know it's it's pretty darn convincing. So I would uh, certainly certainly fix the problem as far as repeat colonoscopies. If you've had polyps, uh, doctors generally recommend you go back and have a repeat colon, colon exam every five to ten years if they find polyps. They have no evidence to support this recommendation. It's just their hunch. You know, there's, there's no evidence that says if you don't follow up, you'll have a higher risk of dying even of colon cancer compared to those who get repeat examination. There's no research done to show that. So, but do, don't they remove the polyps when they're doing a the colonoscopy? They're supposed to, but they miss a lot of them. 42% oh, oh, of the time okay. they miss them. Uh, so, you know. But they can also re remove them. Um, if you right. have a sigmoid, right? Yeah, and, and the, the, the polyps that kill are the ones in the left side of the colon, which are within, within reach of the sigmoid. Uh, the, the polyps that are present on the right side of the colon, the distal colon, when they're removed by a colonoscope, they don't see a survival advantage. August 2010, McDougal newsletter, you'll have all this discussed for you. So yeah, and, and if you have polyps, you should have them removed. Uh, because they are precancerous. But the, the, the fundamental thing you ought to do is start bathing your colon tissues with healthy material. And, uh, and then, you know, I do recommend 
colon cancer screening. You heard me say so. But I think you should be looking in a relatively inexpensive, relatively non-hazardous way, which is to check your stool for blood and maybe a, col a Cologuard test for $600 they cost. And then uh, what you're gonna clear a whole bunch of the population of people so they don't have to go any further. But those of you who have positive stool tests, then you'll have to go on and have a more invasive technique such as a sigmoid. And most likely you'll get a colonoscopy. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. Here's a good general question. It's about, um, it's from Dana. Who would I contact to discuss if I'm an ideal candidate for your 12 day program? Well, you know, what we do is this is, uh, again, this is a, an invention of Heather's since I gave up controlling the business. I still get to supervise. I still get to offer some. Uh, what we do is we allow an initial examination so if you have any question about whether or not you're a candidate for the program for a fee, which is refundable if you decide to take the program, Dr. Lim will spend an adequate amount of time with you, go over your history, your physical, and tell you whether or not the program is of advantage to you and what we'll do for you. And if you decide not to go to the program, then you're charged for his time. You know, standard medical charges, nothing exorbitant. If you decide to go to the program after Dr. Lim's evaluation, then that will be included in your fee for the entire program. We just work that in because everybody who goes to our program spends time with Dr. Lim. And you know some of the people spend time with me, but everybody spends time with Dr. Lim. And so if you wanna know for a, 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 you know, a minuscule amount of money compared to what you're looking at in terms of treatments, if you want to know for $250, that's what the cost of the visit is, I believe you could have it corrected by Heather, but you can spend some time with Dr. Lim and find out exactly- It's not seven minutes either. No, it's not. <laughs> we'll spend adequate time with you to find out what's going on. And you, know, you also get a lot of advice on what you should do. So, you, you know, that'll be valuable for you. Uh, you can just, you know, stick with your own private doctor. You think you know enough to do this on your own. And, you've had some medical intervention and you know what, where to go and what needs to be done. And so maybe, maybe that uh, short visit with Dr. Lim is enough, but I don't think so. I really think that you really need the whole 12 days. You need the support that's provided by our sports specialist, Stacy and Tiffany and Corey, they spend every day with you for those 12 days. You need the education that uh, Jeff Novick and Doug Lyle and myself and Heather and Mary provides you, you need the daily support where every morning we, uh, we spend 45 minutes or more with you during morning chats. And it's a very, very familiar time. You know, we go over all kinds of issues, uh, but it's not, not a lecture type thing. You need to hear the lectures too. And, and, you know, quite honestly, you could get all the lectures pretty much, not all of them. You get a, a, most of the material uh, either by going to the website or going to YouTube. I've had the attitude and I still have it that I, I wanna give it away for free. Why? Because, well, you know, there was a time when we couldn't sell it, nobody would buy it, <laughs> that was 50 years ago. And the other thing is, is that uh, I used to be a very unhealthy man. I would have been dead in my thirties if I hadn't learned this. Mary would have probably been fine. She'd have been maybe 40 pounds heavier than she is now. And I, one artificial hip or something, <laughs> she'd have been alive. <laughs> but my life was saved by this information. And so Mary and I feel an obligation to give back. And that's why we've always offered the program for free. You wanna put a little extra effort, you can have it for free. You want professional help, we have to charge you for it. But you're gonna walk away like everybody does. They're saying, this is the best time and money I've ever spent these 12 days. Great, thank you. Here's a question I saw. Do you have any advice from for thyroid nodules, asks Brigitte. Yeah, you shouldn't look at it for them. And once you find them, you should not do anything about them. <laughs> that is what the scientific research says. Look up, you look up thyroid nodules and you'll see the great controversy. The idea is, is the thyroid nodules are free cancers. Rarely, 
And uh, most of them are, are just a cosmetic issue. In other words, if they get too big, a lump in your throat, in your neck that is, uh, is bothering you cosmetically, then have it taken out. But if you're worried about developing thyroid cancer, no, you don't do that because almost all of them are benign. And you shouldn't go looking for them. Um, anyway, you can leave them alone. That's <laughs> my best advice to you. You get some indication whether there's any possibility of there being cancer in this nodule by doing other tests, which they'll do for you if, if you find nodules. But uh, you're better off in most cases of not doing anything, just leaving them there. Great, thank you. Question, um, have you heard about Dr. Avi claiming that you can't reverse heart disease on a vegan diet? No, but you know, there. <laughs> <laughs> this is the day and age when we, the First Amendment is so important to everybody. And you can say pretty much anything you want and get away with it. You know, he, he, what he has to do is he has to, he has to contradict obvious things like the body does heal. And if, if you believe like I do, that there's a cause of rotten arteries, of coronary artery disease, if you believe there's a cause, then if you stop the cause, the body ought to heal. If you believe the cause is the food, which almost all scientific research says it is, then if you change your diet, you're going to heal. If you believe Dean Arnish's studies and Caldwell Elsison studies and David Blankenhorn's studies, you'll see by scientific studies, we show reversal of artery disease by changing your diet. But a Be vegan diet doesn't necessarily cure all these things oh, because yeah. a vegan diet can be anything that doesn't have an animal in it. You can live on Cokes and potato chips and be vegan. And all the fake meats and yeah. they even have fake eggs now. And yeah. so, you know, you can have a typical American diet, but it can be vegan and it looks the same and it's just as unhealthy. Thank you, Mary. So we don't, yeah. we don't have a vegan diet. We have a starch-based, plant-based, that diet that just happens to be vegan. Yeah, we couldn't figure out any benefit to adding dead animals or animal secretions to this diet of potatoes and rice and corn. <laughs> if there was an advantage to it, if it turned out to be a better diet, I'd have put it in there when I was developing this 50 years ago. But every time I tried to improve upon a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables, I ended up making it worse. Anyway, like I said, this is a day and age when you can say anything you want and get away with it. You can even be president. Well, I'm not going to go into those. <laughs> Never mind. No politics. But, um, you know, I'd be disgusted at what's going on in the name of free speech these days. Yeah. Here's a fun question. You both can answer it. How desperate would you guys have to be to eat junk food? Oh, you have to be hungry. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm not going to die of starvation. I don't think I'd go as far as cannibalism. But I, I, I would, you know, to stay alive. Have you ever been hungry? If you want to have an experiment about your nature that you could get a good education from, just stop eating. Just stop, just don't eat. And you'll find out in fewer than three days what your hunger drive will cause you to do. Mary and I were involved in a, in a church probably 45 years ago. And at that time, we were worried about starving Africans. And so you know me, I stood up and I said, OK, if we want to show our concern for starving Africans, why don't we feel what it's like to starve? And I got most of the congregation to go along with me. And so on Friday night, we stopped eating. We could have water. Saturday morning, I started thinking about food. By Saturday afternoon, that's all I thought about was food. I didn't have any more money problems. I didn't have any more legal problems. I didn't have anything on my mind except food, eating. And the next, uh, the, finally on Sunday, we got together for a dinner. And uh, I want to tell you, if it had been... <laughs> white bread and water, I'd have been thrilled. I was so hungry. You want to learn about your hunger drive? Just don't eat. And then you ask me what you'd eat if you were really, really hungry. I'd eat pretty much anything. 
That's because my body intends to stay alive. But I'm not confronted with that possibility. I have a choice between filling up my stomach with foods that'll kill me and filling up my stomach with foods that support better health. <clears throat> but, uh, you're not, I don't think you're gonna starve and not eat anything available that provides calories. I remember reading that book, and I think about this a lot, Mary, about the guy who was a prisoner of war in World War II. What was the movie they just put out about this fellow? Remember he said he was the runner? He, he was a he was a runner and he was captured. I believe it was uh, he went. It was a Japanese prisoner of war camp. You know what oh, it is. You know yeah. that that yeah. movie. It's a book. I read the book. I did too. Yeah, I don't remember now. But it, this guy would would eat paste off the wall. He was so hungry, and this was a treat. Do you know it was it was a, it was a paste of glue. A good book to let you understand what it's like to be under a lot of duress. Try being a prisoner of war. Why? That's scary. Wow. Thank you. This is from Peter. If a person doesn't have an addiction to it, from a health perspective, how does Dr. McDougall feel about a celebratory glass of wine a few times a year? But who can do it a few times a year? I don't know <laughs> anybody that can do anything a few times a year. Well, they're known as moderate people. Well, we're not one of those. That's not us, no. no. Uh, it is true that alcohol is sociable, wines taste good. And for nine out of 10 people, uh, it'd be just fine because you can drink you know, occasionally and you're not an alcoholic and you don't get behind the wheel of a car and you don't go home and beat up with a wife and kids. But for one out of 10 people, it's not that way they do get behind the wheel of a car and kill people. And they do go home and beat up the wife and kids. These are called alcoholics. So you can't put, you can't put alcohol and health in the same sentence because of that. However, you know, if you're in the nine out of 10 that doesn't have this affliction, and unfortunately, many of you don't realize you've got a problem. <laughs> Then yeah, you know, I don't. I agree. I, I think you have an occasional glass of wine is of no detriment at all. But for a medical professional to recommend alcohol to the general population is malpractice. Shouldn't be done. The destruction, the damage is so great. You said in your talk that caffeine raises blood pressure. So why are so many doctors recommending caffeine, even cardiologists? Because probably because they drink coffee themselves. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, you know, it raises cholesterol, it raises blood pressure. I'll give you a tip that was worth your time spending with us this morning. There, there was a lot of confusion back in the 1980s about coffee raising blood cholesterol. Good research published in the scientific literature, half of it showed that drinking coffee raised cholesterol by about 10%, but the other half didn't. And these were both run by good scientists. And then they looked at the methods of brewing and they figured out why. If you cook your coffee in a strainer, you know, percolate it, then you raise cholesterol by about 10%. If you cook it through a coffee maker that uses a paper filter, you remove the cholesterol raising fatty acids by the paper. And so you don't see an elevation in cholesterol in those who drink paper filter coffee. Now, wasn't that a good tip, huh? But it could still raise blood pressure. It still raise blood pressure and decaf coffee raises cholesterol even more than regular coffee. And yeah, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of things around. Coffee is not health food fun, folks. Uh, coffee is fun. Coffee's a drug, a la Starbucks. Biggest drug dealers in the whole world, Starbucks. So well, now they have these really fancy coffee machines that you can make your own shot, espresso shots at home and, and all this fancy stuff because people really like their coffee. Right. Never too high. <laughs> the higher, the better. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you can tell by experience, I do. Is green tea just as detrimental? Because that has caffeine. It does, but it, it isn't. Uh, if you look at the... Uh, the studies on tea drinkers, 
they may initially raise the blood pressure, but it comes down even if it's caffeinated. And they show no increased risk in heart disease. I don't believe that raises cholesterol either, but it's not the caffeine that raises cholesterol. It's other alkaloids in the coffee pod. So, uh, you know, both contain caffeine, but don't, both don't contain the alkaloids that raise, that raise cholesterol. And likewise, uh, you don't get this serious indigestion from drinking tea that you get from drinking coffee. Now, every serious coffee drinker carries around a, you know, a pocket full of antacids because they have constant indigestion. But the thing to note is that you have just as severe indigestion on decaf coffee as regular coffee because it's not the caffeine that causes the acid production. It's other alkaloids that are in the plant. So just by removing the caffeine, you don't make caffeinated coffee better, except for the caffeine effects, of course, that may be a big deal for you. You may want to do it that way. But uh, you know, my philosophy has always been, if you're going to drink the disgusting stuff, you might as well have some fun doing it. So why drink decaf? <laughs> Again, you can tell a lot about me <laughs> if you listen carefully. Uh, you know, I've been able to, I've been able to uh, even though I've had a lot of bad habits in my life and you know that I don't hide them, I've been able to get control of these things and, and not ruin my life. Otherwise, I'd have been dead. You know, we're talking about tobacco. We're talking about alcohol. We're talking about food. You know, I, I almost killed myself many, many occasions, too many occasions, but you know, by experience, I learned that you shouldn't do these things. And uh, hopefully most of you have learned the same thing. But I know there are some of you that are just goody goody two shoes out there. and You don't do anything bad. <laughs> so I probably not talking to you. I mean, great. Thanks. Um, there's a question about something you spoke on in the past hormone cream. Does it have any side effects to the breast or weight? Okay, in the book, the the McDougal program for women, which is free. You go to the, you go to the shop on the website and you order the book. And when you get down to check out, check out, you see that there's no charge for the PDF file. And the McDougal program for women talks about all kinds of women problems, all the way from hysterectomies and fibroid tumors to promote, uh, to menopause, to precocious puberty, osteoporosis, heart disease, and so on. And chapter 13 is about hormone replacement therapy. And what it somewhere in that chapter tells you is that the way to take hormone replacement therapy is through skin creams that are made of estradiol, which is the hormone that you made when you were still menstruating and progesterone. And so these two hormones are combined by a compound pharmacy. They're much more potent than hormones taken by mouth. They're much more reliable than hormones taken by mouth. So it's the preferred way to deliver the hormone to your tissues, but they have adverse effects, all right? Uh, people who take hormones have more gallbladder disease. They have more blood clots. They have stimulate the uterus and keep the uterine lining from sh continue to shed. You develop abnormal menstrual periods, heavy menstrual periods, blood clots, uh, uterine cancer from estrogens. So yeah, these are real drugs, they're real hormones. You need to be careful. You need to decide that this will do you more good than harm. But I, I find this in a lot of women is they need to have uh, some relief at the time of menopause. And so I do prescribe more than just an occasion. You know, I used to be a big part of my practice, not a real big part. Nobody ever knew, but I, I used to prescribe commonly to women at the menopausal years, uh, skin creams, and most of them were really happy with this prescription. They didn't feel a lot better. The other, the other situation I prescribe hormone replacement in is when you wanna fool mother nature. Mother nature says that after the time has passed when you have, can have babies, you're not supposed to have, or you don't need to have sex anymore. Well, a lot of us have passed that age where, where we can have babies, but we still wanna have a little fun. 
And so hormone replacement creams, estradiol, as prim, uh, as, estradiol, not, not, uh, not, pre uh, not primarin. Not primarin. Yeah. Hormone replacement creams so may be a, a nice addition to a woman's uh, body that would make her have a, a better sex life uh, because the vagina becomes very thin. As I say, nature says there's no reason to have sex after you can't have babies. So the vaginal tissues become very, very thin. Well, if you don't, are, are not comfortable with that, then the, the way to deal with it is have your doctor prescribe estrogen creams, vaginal creams. Every doctor can do it. Every doctor has these creams. They don't have to be made by a compounding pharmacy like the skin creams do. And I think you'll find them valuable. I think that you probably will end up taking them every day for a week or so till you get the vagina toughened up. And then you maybe will need them just once a week or, or maybe twice a week to keep things the way you want. If you have sporadic sexual relationships, in other words, it just happens once in a while and you can plan for it, you can just use the estrogens a few days before that activity. And again, trying to minimize the drug therapy because it has adverse effects and taking advantage of its positive effects. Anyway, all that's discussed in the women's book, which is free at www.drmcdougall.com. You go shop, and as I say, when you check out, you can get uh, McDougall's Medicine of Challenging Second Opinion, the McDougall Program for Women, I believe the McDougall Program for Heart Disease is also free. There are three more books that I'm gonna give you as time goes on, uh, free. Why do I do it for free? Well, you know, I think you ought to spread the good news. And if I can help you in any way, then I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you the written material that I worked so hard putting together in 13 national best-selling books. I want you to share it with people. When you get that PDF from McDougall's Medicine of Challenging Second Opinion, you should send it to everybody you know. You should get the mailing list for the Harvard Medical School and send it to all their young doctors. <laughs> you know, spread the good news. Help me. Please help me. You remember that saying, it's not nice to fool Mother Nature. <laughs> well, you know, AJ, I don't go, I need to go into your personal health, but I sure know about your attitude. And my guess is that, well, no, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That is so funny. Do you think you'll ever write another book? I don't think so. Uh, I've written pretty much everything that I have known about and become an expert on. I was gonna write a book on uh, diet and climate change, but that was written. It's called Food is Climate. It's really, really a good book. You ought to read it. And uh, so I was gonna write that book, but I couldn't quite make the deal with the book company to do it. So I didn't do it. Instead, I, I put together a website on diet and climate change. And we're just starting to release this website and you're welcome to visit it. It's not quite finished yet, but it's close enough that it, it will do more good than harm for you to take a look at it at this stage. It's under the following title link. It's www.mcdougallfoundation.org, not .com, but .org. And I think you'll have a lot of fun visiting that website. The dedication is to, the theme is what can one person do to help mitigate climate change. You know, what they can do is they can change what they eat. So there's so much dismal information out there about the climate. New York Times put together, put out an article yesterday that talked about there is some hope. And my website is dedicated to optimism. There is hope, there are things we can do. And so, um, what we can all do is we can change our diet and that will do more for the planet than anything else. That's what the website is dedicated to. It's mcdougallfoundation.org. If you have any comments, you know, send them to me. I, I certainly would rather have criticism from you folks than from the people that I'm hopefully gonna meet someday soon who have uh, an interest in seeing me fail. You can imagine there are a lot of people out there that would like to see me fail. You're such a resilient person. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I've got a lot going for me, AJ. I'm, I'm healthy. I've got an amazing partner in life. I had an opportunity, good education, and I work hard. And 
So it's pretty hard to, to, to fluster me. I know, but the way you guys bounce back from the fight, I mean, like, it's amazing to me, both of you, you're like, I mean, I, lesser things have happened to me and I freak oh. out. <laughs> well, you had to get over losing everything. You know, when we lost everything in the wildfires of California, the attitude I had to take or just to get through it was how many people get to stay, start their life over again when they're 70? You know, how many people are lucky enough to have to be to put themselves in a situation where the kids and grandkids didn't have to sort through all the garbage you collected in the basement and the attic? <laughs> Our kids don't have to do that now. Everything was <laughs> sorted through in five minutes. <clears throat> you know, I got tired of the scratches on my car. Didn't have to worry about them anymore. Tesla's melt. <laughs> Oh man, that was a mess. I went out to the garage and I, I had a Tesla and I had a truck and you could, oh, we had an Audi too. And you could see the frames of the truck and the Audi, whereas the Tesla, because it's made of aluminum, it was just a puddle. That hurt me. That, that broke my heart. I love that car. Well, we didn't spend a lot of time going through the, um, well, well, whatever was left, the ashes. We just decided <clears throat> like we don't want to look at it anymore. And so we just had it all just moved to Portland. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's to Portland. Such, a, such a great attitude because Charles has so much crap. I mean, I don't want to be in a fire, but I mean that's how I would look at it too. It's <laughs> like, yay, decluttering, you know. <laughs> really? And you didn't lose what was most precious. So that no, was really no, nobody got hurt. We were about three minutes from being burned alive. <laughs> Uh, fortunately, our grandkids were persistent and, you know, had to almost knock down the door to wake us up. But, you know, that happened at 1255. At one o'clock, the house was gone. So it was, so uh, I don't like to look back at those times. <laughs> yeah. yeah anyway, we, we, we've been very fortunate. I have no complaints at all. But it was a bit disturbing for us to lose everything. Everything that was material, we yeah. lost. Yeah. I don't have all the scientific papers I collected for 40 years. That that bothers me a bit. A whole basement full of file cabinets of research papers, and they're all gone. But fortunately, I put most of the important ones up on the internet, and so I got the really good ones. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there are lots of things that Mary looks at that bring back memories. And, but it's, it's, it's we're over it. We we. Have, have had to let it go. You know that. You, many of you have been through some tragedies in your life. What's much worse, that's the other attitude I took, AJ, is that what happened to us was nothing compared to what happens to my patients. Really, I mean, I would hear from people every day, three or four or five times a day, with problems that, that burning your house and losing everything in your home paled against. Our problems were tiny compared to theirs. So I've taken that attitude too. You know, what we went through was basically nothing, no big deal compared to what some of you had to go through. And you're so good about taking criticism. I mean, like it doesn't bother you when people say bad things about you. Like I crumble. Oh, well, you, you, I, don't, you don't see them afterwards. Yeah, well, you know, the truth of the matter is, is they very, very seldom say things to my face. I don't know why. But it's, uh, I hear about it usually secondhand behind my back. Yeah, what are you going to say about me? You know, what are you going to say? Because you know, I put together some pretty solid science. Yeah. Well, everybody here loves you. And they're really they're remarking on your idemic memory, how you remember exactly the newsletter. of. Oh, well, isn't that amazing? You should go on Jeopardy, Dr. McDougall. <laughs> With your recall, you'd be he able doesn't, to. He doesn't know um, trivia. He was oh. never any good at trivial pursuit. So uh, he's only good at medical journals and, and uh, <clears throat> newsletters that he's written. Oh, that's because that's what there I love. His, there's babies. You know, those are the things that get me excited. You know, scientific papers. I can't tell you the last time I read a novel where Mary reads three to five novels a week. I read 13 journals a week. <laughs> Just weird. What can I say? 
That is something. Well, we have a we asked we have a question from Elizabeth asking if you can touch on bone density and from EJ, what to do for painful periods. Well, let's take the painful period thing first. Uh, if you change your diet within a couple of menstrual periods, uh, your periods will become lighter. They'll become further apart and fewer days of bleeding. And the clots should go away too. Now, when I say that by the next period or two, a lot of this depends upon how much body fat you have. Because body fat makes estrogens. And so you may have to wait to hit trim body weight before all the things that I told you are true. If you are near the years of menopause, and menopause means you've dropped your last egg, you've had your last bleed. If you're near the age of menopause, you'll go through menopause right about the time you change your diet. That'll take care of your periods. You, you know, going on a low fat diet, losing the weight, you'll stop menstruating. So that, that would handle the issues very big time. And of course, there are some reasons for, for bleeding that are more medically important and you'll want to see your doctor about that, but just generally heavy periods, blood clots, prolonged periods. It's a hormone imbalance created by eating the Western diet, easily fixed by changing your diet. The other question was, what was it, the other question? Could you please touch on bone density? Oh, bone density. Bone, bone, bone mineral density testing was not even paid by Medicare uh, until about 20 years ago, because it's so inaccurate. Uh, but they, you know, they finally pushed it through, particularly the drug companies that sell drugs based upon the bone mineral density. In fact, it was three drug companies uh, that got together for the committee uh, that formed the committee for the World Health Organization that determined the use of bone mineral density for women, for women. three drug companies. Anyway, it's, uh, what it does is it measures the density of the bones. In other words, it measures the amount of mineral in the bones. Naturally, 70% of women have a precipitous drop in their bone mineral density when they go through menopause. 70% of women are diagnosed as having osteopenia or osteoporosis by the age of 70. Why? Because when you're a woman in your reproductive years, you store two pounds of minerals in your bones for the baby, for the baby's bones and for the breast milk afterwards, you store an extra two pounds in your bones. Well, when you hit menopause, your body says, oh, I don't need to carry this two pounds around all the time. And so, cause I'm not gonna have any babies. So the body naturally dumps the minerals, but that doesn't mean the bone strength is reduced. Bone strength and mineral and mineral accumulation has a very weak relationship. That's why bone mineral density tests aren't very predictive as to your risk of having a fracture is because you can have strong bones and most people do without all this mineral. This mineral, the bones are just a depot for the place for the minerals to sit. Bone strength is determined by, by uh, tissue let me give you an analogy. Something with a high mineral content would be a piece of chalk. Okay, you, you remember a chalk when you used to write on a chalkboard? That's 100% mineral. How strong is it? How much does it resist fractures? Okay, remember the days when you used to eat chicken and you got done stripping the leg off the chicken, what you ended up with is bone and you'd take and twist the bone. You could almost tie it in knots because it was the tissue you were looking at. As I say, the, the correlation between bone mineral density and, and uh, bone strength is very weak. Bones hold on to the minerals for the day when you have a baby. And when it's time to not have babies, <laughs> your bone <laughs> density decreases. But you know, your doctor doesn't know this. And so therefore, you flunk the test, lady, you're going to have to be on the drugs. Don't argue about it. Just take them. Why does the doctor do that? Because the doctor was taught by the drug companies to sell drugs. We are the best drug pushers around. We're all day long advertised by drug companies to sell their products. And of course, it fits well with our business too, because you know, talking to people takes time. But I can hand you a prescription and have you out of the office in seven minutes. Next, 
and Mary commented a couple of days ago about all these ads on TV for treating arthritis, $30,000 for the drug for a year, multiple sclerosis, $70,000 for the drug for a year, diabetes drugs, the new, the new really fancy ones, $24,000 a year for the year of drugs. Well, when, the, when the, on TV, they tell you about a problem that you may or may not have. If you think you might, you might have a little rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera, or bowel problem, et cetera. What do you do next? You go to the doctor. That does really, so they drive, they drive you into the doctor's arms. And you ask for the, that pill that you saw on oh, TV. Oh yeah, I want, I want this one right here. The, or the injection. No, it's not that these, you know, it's not that doctors uh, are dishonest or do only harm. There are a lot of good doctors out there. And there are a lot of good things that were available to, to help you with. It's just by and large, it's a crooked business. So spend some time listening to all the, the negative things that they tell you afterward. This may cause, yeah. and there's a whole list. Of 90 things. seconds of things that ought to scare you to death about taking this drug. <laughs> But they told you, so when the lawsuit comes up, they can say, well, I told you, you know, you should have known that I didn't take this drug. It gave you cancer, you know, killed you. Well, I said so in the disclaimer after the, the, the pretty girl running around in the field and smiling and laughing and having a great old time because she's taking the drug. Yep. Get, get, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. Get out of the business. <laughs> Get away from these people. And the only way you can do that safely is to be a healthy person. And the only way that most of you can be healthy is to figure out what the problem is. And the problem is the food. And the answer is a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables, a little exercise, and some sunshine. That's it. Costs nothing. No side effects always works too. <laughs> I've got 12,000 people that I've taken care of in my career that would tell you that it works. Now, not all of them have had great success, but they've at least had enough experience with what I do to know it works. Well, and you have a lot of people that have also done this on their own, so you don't even know about them. Well, yeah, we get letters, uh, amazing letters from people <clears throat> from all over the world. From, all times in our practice. And one of the things that makes me feel best about being a doctor is when I get a letter from somebody and they say, well, Dr. McDougall, I heard you give a lecture 50 years ago at, at St. Francis Hospital in Honolulu. And you taught me about how to eat. And I just want you to know my, my friends, all my friends are in assist, are the ones that aren't dead are in assisted living facilities and they have disability stickers and and I'm having a great time with my grandkids and my kids and I'm still working and 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 I know that's because of what I heard you say 45 years ago then I feel like I've really done my job now you can help anybody for a day or two or even 12 days at our program but to make a difference in somebody's whole life and to have them appreciate it which we have you know I, I would guess I probably hear from 100 people a year those are just the ones I hear from who write me and thank me. And boy, do I feel good about that. I, that's, that's, that makes my day when I know I, I'm known I've done that kind of service for a person. Question, can we heal the kidneys? Well, lots of bad things can happen to the kidneys. Depends on what you're looking for. Uh, you're not gonna grow a new kidney back. However, if you lose a kidney, your one kidney will proliferate. So you sort of do grow a new kidney back. Uh, you know, kidney damage is commonly caused by atherosclerosis, uh, the Western diet, and that's the most common cause of kidney disease. They, call, they say the diabetes caused or the high blood pressure caused it. Well, what caused the diabetes and high blood pressure was the rich food. You might as well go back to that. And some of that can be reversed. If you take any reason for kidney failure, and there's a whole chapter in the book, McDougall's Medicine of Challenging Second Opinion, which many of you will go to the website and get for free. A whole chapter on kidney disease, what it tells you if you feed, and we've known this for a hundred years. Every doctor knows this, who has any interest in kidneys at all. 
If you feed people with failing kidneys, a low protein diet, you will dramatically improve their kidney function and you will slow the progression of their kidney disease down. So likely most of them or many of them will not have to end up on a dialysis machine. Whether you have polycystic kidney disease or you've lost a kidney because you donated one to somebody, lost it in an accident, lost it due to an infection, doesn't matter. If you take good care of the remaining kidney, it's likely to last you a lifetime. You're, you're, you're so over, over provided for as far as kidney function, you can lose 90% of your kidney function, at least 75% of the kidney function before you notice anything. 25% of kidney function is enough to clear all the waste that the body produces. You won't even know you had any loss of kidney until 75% of it's gone. But what about if you eat, eat an unhealthy diet? Well, then what happens is you rapidly get rid of the last oh, 25%. Okay. So, but eating a good diet, you keep that 25% of kidney function. Anyway, you can either get the book, which I told you how to get it, or, and you can read, you go to the website, go to Hot Topics, you go to Kidney Disease. There's an article I wrote a few years back, big thorough article, Send it to your friends, your fellows, your physicians, and so on. It's a PDF file, which talks about diet and kidney disease and tells you about a lot of the things that I just tried to share with you and much, much more because I wrote it down. Because I knew there would be a day when I couldn't remember it all. Of it. <laughs> so I wrote it down. I put it in books and newsletters and I put it on video because you know what? Believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to be here forever. I know you're disappointed. <laughs> Dr. McDougall's never supposed to die. He eats vegetables. <laughs> That's funny. Well, that, well, when you do, we have another one. You have another doctor? Oh, that's right. That <laughs> yeah, Craig. We have Craig. Yeah, we have Craig. She, yes, you do. And he's a great doctor for any of you. Well, he's a professor at OHSU. And any of you. But he still sees patients. He does, but it's really hard to get into his practice. Yeah. Unless of course you have a, you have a, a connection. <laughs> and our patients who've been through our program, I will often make available to them, doctors who otherwise wouldn't take them into their practice. But you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put that kind of effort into uh, people unless they are willing to put some effort into themselves. You know, you, you come halfway with me, you, you take the trouble to learn the program and and that really means you come to one of the McDougall programs, either the previous hospital-based program that I did for 16 years at St. Lynn Hospital, or the resort-based program that we did for 18 years, or now the telemedicine, telehealth program we've done for two years. And you become almost, a McDougall yeah, patient. Almost two years. Yeah. Otherwise, you don't call up and make an appointment. <laughs> but if you're a McDougall patient, you're a patient for life but you only get to be a McDougall patient if you're willing to put some effort in that we're willing, we can see. You at least learn the program, at least try. Life's too short for me to have one night stands. Nice. You know what, um, so I don't think the people watching know that I stream to seven different places. So what I see in my chat goes quickly. And so some of the questions have disappeared. So if you want to repost, you can, because there was one that I really wanted to ask about somebody who said they're eating the way you suggest, but still had an ischemic heart attack. What more could they do? Yeah. Well, you know, what, what I would say is that uh, 150 years ago, heart disease was not described in the United States. Uh, so, and, and there are parts of the world, uh, up like 50 years ago, there were no heart attacks, like in rural Japan or rural Africa. So I have to assume that you can make a big dent in the progression of this disease by going back to these traditional diets, like people ate in Japan or in Africa, starch-based diets. Does, do things always happen? No, they don't always happen. There are always exceptions. But in general, people who truly follow the type of diet I recommend, unless they have diabetes, unless they have a whole bunch of metabolic problems that have set them back, they don't have heart attacks. They don't have strokes. That's been my experience, They're very rare. 
and uh, but it's no guarantee for sure. But, but you have to understand some of the people that I see, they are seriously overweight. They've been diabetic for many years. You know, they're, they're really, they have, they have bad tissues and they're past the point, not of helping, but of, of, of promising immunity or really you're gonna have a great life without serious health problems. No, I, can't, I can't do that. Uh, for some of the people who have progressed to the point where they have their systems really, really damaged. Otherwise, I think it's fair for me to say that if you follow a good diet, you'll avoid dietarily caused diseases, which are probably 90% of the afflictions that people have in our country. We're talking about heart disease, coronary artery disease, affects half the people in our country either have heart attacks or strokes, 100% preventable. You know, cancer is, uh, yeah, let's see, I'll give you the day nine cancer. A lot of people get cancer, you know, I, I believe it's around, well, anyway, let's, let me not throw statistics, <laughs> I can't remember it. But these are dietarily caused cancers like breast and prostate and colon. You know, prior to World War II, these were not described in rural Japan. They had no breast cancer. I, I got a letter from a women's group recently that uh, is uh, a group of women in Japan who have breast cancer. And they reflected on the facts that their mothers never saw a case of breast cancer in Japan. Their grandma never heard of a case of breast cancer in Japan. This is a disease that exists when you introduce the Western diet to a country. T. Colin Campbell's, the China study, he showed that uh, in various communities, when you reduce the fat intake from say 40% to 7%, which is naturally present in the starches, vegetables, and fruits, when you reduce uh, the fat intake, the chance of dying of breast cancer decreases. There's no threshold. It's not like at 20% fat intake, you start seeing the effect of fat. The lower you go, the less your risk of having breast cancer. So that should tell you that, you know, there, there's no safe threshold. You need to do the best you can. No, that, um, there are people asking about mammograms and you've already done a talk on this channel about breast cancer, but Gina said, what if you have the gene for breast cancer? You, you mean like the BRCA gene? I, I'm guessing she just said gene for breast cancer, but then do well, you still there, not there's, recognize There's, a, there's a, a, a BRCA variant, BRCA one and two, which uh, occurs in some women, what's her name? Jo and, and, Angelina Jolie. Angelina Jolie, I believe she had it. And uh, you have a high risk of getting breast and ovarian cancer. The interesting thing is, is that uh, cutting off your breast does not change your risk of dying of breast cancer. Cutting out your ovaries does. And if you look at the lecture that I gave on breast cancer, you know that removing estrogen stimulation is part of the treatment that I offer women who have breast cancer because when you cut out the estrogens, the cancer doesn't grow as rapidly in the breast. So it's kind of interesting and people who have the gene, you know, they're getting their breasts cut off a, a high rate prophylactic mastectomy. And they always leave a little breast tissue behind even though they try and be thorough. Uh, these women, they'll have the breasts removed but they won't have the ovaries removed. And so they, they should have a prophylactic they should, ovary. Yeah, they should, yeah. Oh, okay. You know, if, if they really want to do something, no, they should change their diet. <laughs> That's what they ought to do. But if they want to have some extra benefits, they can go on an anti-estrogen program like taking tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is been used to prevent breast cancer. It's an anti-estrogen drug. And uh, they can have the ovaries removed. Women who don't have ovary function throughout life never get breast cancer. Okay? And there are, you know, some situations where a woman is deprived of ovary function throughout her whole life, never get breast cancer. That's, that's an oh, that's article that got yeah. burned up in my basement. <laughs> I never heard that. Actually, before. I wrote that. I think I wrote that in McDougal's Medicine, a challenging second opinion. Okay. And, uh, so the I'm, reference would be there too. Probably. And the, if it's not there, it's in the McDougal program for women, two books that I offer you for free at the website. You'll find it there. Just look through it and find it. You'll find it. I usually remember where it is, but not always. 
Great. This is a fun question for you, Mary, from Kathy. Have you ever won an argument with Dr. McDougall? I don't know. I don't. <laughs> See, we need that one of us can remember. No, we really pretty much are, are simpatico. You know, yeah, we don't argue very much. Yeah, we, we really quite run kind of the, the, the same things in life we always have, and that's why we got together. Because we're both very positive people who uh, I think look, look at problems in life similarly. And I think, I think whenever we have maybe a disagreement about something, either one or the other of us will um, come up with a solution and say, hey, what about this instead? Well, I have to, I have to say that if you want the answer to the question, it's I acquiesce, acquiesce. Acquiesce? Ac thank you, acquiesce. Yes. <laughs> I, 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 to Mary, because she's really a smart woman. <laughs> And uh, it, quite often I recognize that I'm wrong uh, real quickly into an, any type of adversarial discussion. So I've, I've learned that about her is uh, I picked a really, really good mate. You know, 50 years ago, I, I, I didn't make a mistake, ladies and gentlemen. You know, I, but I had some good, I had some great parents that taught me how to pick a mate. They, they said, uh, they said, John, you, you uh, you have to, you have to marry somebody who likes themselves. You have to marry a happy person because they're never going to make you happy. You're never going to make them happy. They said, <laughs> and of course I took it personal, but, but the truth is you can't change people. And so what you end up uh, choosing early in life, you, that's the person you married. You're not going to change them. So I look for a happy person and the other thing my parents told me is about, they taught me about honesty. And they said, you know, Johnny, if you're honest, you'll know who that person is when you meet her. And I, I dated a lot of very, very nice young women before I met Mary. And I'll tell you, I fell in love at first sight. I knew <laughs> she was the right one. And uh, I could just feel it. I just knew it. And the 50 years we spent together, we had our 50th anniversary just a couple of months ago. I think pretty much proves it. And I think the three highly successful children we raised pretty much proves it. And I think the fun we had in life pretty much proves it. We, <laughs> we've done so much together. We have uh, sailed sailboats across the ocean. We've taken people on adventure trips all over the world. And we've we've flown both, airplanes. Yeah, we're both, we're both the twin engine IFR rated pilots. They all get or on an airplane and flying an airplane all over the country. If you can get in some really serious arguments, you better solve these <laughs> arguments quick too. Otherwise you're going to be dead. All right, Mary, what do you think you ought to do here? <laughs> or you better get it right. But anyway, we, we've had a lot of fun together. What do you guys do for fun? Cause you're reading your journals. Mary's reading her novels. When do you guys get together and have fun? Well, you know, at our stage in life, uh, AJ, and Mary would add to this, I think, um, what she feels about it. We spend a lot of time with our children and grandkids. We get a lot of pleasure out of that. Uh, we go for walks every day like that. Mm -hmm. There's certain TV programs that are our favorites. We enjoy those. We have a few friends, not many, that we enjoy. And, um, you know, we don't do the things that we did early in life, like scuba diving sailing sailboats and flying airplanes and we don't ski anymore no we used to own a condo and ski 60 days a year uh, those those, di those you, times you learn to be a little more careful about your body when you get to be our age yeah because you don't want to fall <laughs> we gave up skiing a year a few years back not not too many years back i think it probably well, maybe just before when the, the fire <laughs> happened because we had just bought yeah. new skis yeah, the fire really changed our lives a lot. We, everything, and you know, I had 11 windsurfing boards. We had, uh, you know, really nice ski equipment. Uh, but we had a lot, a lot of the things that we did for hobbies, all of the, the tools were in our garage. And they were gone, and we just didn't see any reason to replace them. But I am going windsurfing again. Yes, I am. <laughs> there's, there's no, there's, where can you windsurf around you? Is there a place? Oh, Columbia River. I've, yeah. I've been out there. Oh, Hood River. Hood River. Okay, good. Excellent. Yeah. All right. I know how you feel about vitamin D, but Susan says if your 
blood test shows it at 25, even though in your in the sun, an hour a day, more than an hour a day walking and swimming, do you still not recommend taking vitamin D? Correct. I don't recommend taking it. 25, by the way, is, a, is a, in the normal range for many laboratories. But uh, <clears throat> you can tell the story about the Hawaiian surfers. Yeah, th th there's a, a study and you'll find it um, in the newsletters that I've written on vitamin D. Just go to the website and our vitamin D. But uh, they did a study on surfers who spent an average of 28 hours a week in the sun and half of them flunked the vitamin D test. So there's something wrong with the test for sure. Uh, one of the problems is that the test has been pretty much invented to sell you lab tests and drugs. So it's, it's, it's set up so that most people fail, so that they become customers. Not based on any really good science that says you need a particular level of vitamin D to be most healthy. The other thing is, is that your vitamin D level depends upon whether or not you have chronic inflammation. And you get chronic inflammation from eating the Western diet. That's where it comes from. You're chronically inflamed because of the bad foods. And so it also is expressed as things like diabetes and arthritis and obesity and so on. But it's really just plain old inflammation that occurs from an uncontrolled fork and spoon. And a byproduct of inflammation is a substance that lowers vitamin D levels artificially. So if you're truly going to correct your vitamin D levels, you need to correct the inflammation. And in other words, you've got to correct the food. Uh, the other thing that you ought to be well aware of is that as far as, I'm, uh, as far as my reading skills go, over the last 15 years, I can find no studies that disagree with this. And that is that if you're going to take more than 2,000 international units, and many are prescribed 5,000 and 10,000, if you're going to take more than 2,000 international units, all the studies done show that you increase your risk of falls and fractures. Because this level of vitamin D causes new imbalances in your nervous system and muscles, which cause you to fall. Now, there are many, many other studies that show even lower doses of vitamin D will cause an increased risk in falls and fractures. But that's what the research says. So if you buy into the idea that there's something wrong with you because your D levels are low, which you never thought about checking because you always believed that vitamin D was the sunshine vitamin. And you got plenty of sunshine. That was always good enough for everybody before, before the meddling influence of the vitamin supplement companies and the laboratories and the doctors who order them. The disease mongers. The disease, thank you, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sunshine always worked before, and if you're going to get adequate sunshine, which is not a lot, a white person like me needs almost none. Tiny bit at noon, five minutes a day on my hands and face, I'll do it. Uh, you know, if, if you're going to buy into the drug business, you need to realize these drugs are dangerous. You need to understand that, uh, you know, people who get lots of sunshine flunk the vitamin D test. Oh, you, you need to know these things and maybe you'll decide not to take it. Mary flunked the vitamin D test when we got one done on her. We'd been to Hawaii and Costa Rica. <laughs> we had a backyard swimming pool at the level of Santa Rosa, California. We used to sit out there every day and she flunked the test. Anyways, she didn't take supplements. <laughs> we, it, but sunshine is important. It's really crucial you get sunshine. I've mentioned it at least six times in, just in the last two hours. You need to get sunshine, not just for the vitamin D, but a whole bunch of things that happen to your body that are dependent upon sunlight. Yeah. Even your mood. Your mood, yeah. That seasonal affective disorder, that's a, everybody's heard about that, how you use light boxes to change you, your mood, to get you out of depression. Set your circadian rhythm. Uh, it affects whether or not, you know, affects your, your, your jet lag when you go to a different, Part of the world, uh, you reset your internal clock by the sun rising and setting. Great. So here's the question that I, I that disappeared, but she wrote it again, Joe. Whole food plant based more than eight years. I saute in water, no oil, yet I still had an ischemic heart attack. I have a plugged artery on the right side of my heart. What more can I do when my diet consists mainly of steel cut oats, potatoes, 
rice, salads, fruits, and vegetables, yet my CRP still comes back at 11. Oh, I don't know. I, I, I would say that, like I, like I mentioned before, some of the people I have, take care of have spent decades of getting themselves in bad shape, but she shouldn't have had a heart attack. Uh, not if she followed a healthy diet. Uh, let's see, what else would I do? I'd maybe add some cholesterol lowering medication. William Clifford Roberts, who is the, a friend of mine, but a good friend of mine. And he was head of the pathology department of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, he used to say that uh, as long as you ate a good diet and had a low cholesterol, you weren't gonna have a heart attack. And, uh, but he also used to say that if you do have evidence of heart disease, no matter what your cholesterol is at that time, it's too high. So even if you got a good blood test in uh, of a cholesterol level and you have that kind of history, I might reach to a mild dose of statins. That would be something extra you could do. And then again, there's always the possibility that you haven't been following the diet as prescribed, but I'll assume you have. Uh, then it really, it really befuddles me as to why you had a heart attack. As I say, there, up until recently, there were populations of millions of people and nobody had a heart attack, like in Japan. Well, like you said, though, if she had not been, I mean, she might've had 40 years of um, not eating a healthy yeah. diet. And wouldn't that, yeah, that, that it, would make a difference? Big difference. If you're diabetic, uh, you've done a lot of, a lot of damage to your system and the, as, as it wouldn't surprise me if even if you changed your diet, you had more problems. So, what about anyway, I, hope you've re I hope you've reaped some benefit from following our recommendations for eight years. I hope but they've been worth your while. Don't, don't you sometimes when people aren't getting results, they get the last stop on the train and you send them to True North? Yeah, but not when it comes to heart disease issues. Well, maybe, maybe, you know, what I'll do... Uh, AJ is, is an, an occasional person just refuses to follow the McDougal diet. So I, I send them over there to True North and after a couple of weeks of just water, they think what we serve is pretty darn good. So the non-compliant person will often get an invitation to go over to True North and there's an occasional person, and yes, I've talked to you about it, who I've not been able to help. And these will be people with autoimmune diseases like ulcerative colitis or rheumatoid arthritis. I think the major reason I haven't been able to help them is because I just wasn't able to control what was going on with them for a long enough period of time. Whereas over at True North, they lock you up for pretty much as long as you want to be locked up. And, uh, and they put you on water. the yeah, they put you on the ultimate elimination diet. Uh, they're, they're, they're a great program, but they're the last effort in town for me is helping you get better. Great. Okay, here's a really fun question for both of you. If you hadn't become a doctor, Mary, a nurse, what other professions do you think you might have been? Huh. Well, I um, unfortunately, I grew up in a family um, that um, believed that there were really only two professions for a woman. You could either be a nurse or a teacher. So, you know, if I hadn't had any other influence, you know, I probably would have been a teacher. That's, and that's what my sister was. I was a nurse, my sister was a teacher. And so um, I didn't have the, the kind of um, family that John had when they said, you know, you could be anything. Yeah. yeah, my parents raised me with no limitations. You know, they told me when I was a kid, I could be president if I wanted to be president. And I know some of you have been raised in those kind of families too, so you understand what I'm saying. If I had not become a doctor, uh, the ocean is my love. I'd have been an oceanographer. You know, I'd have spent my whole life uh, de dealing with sea life. And still, it's where I spend most of my time as far as outside activities is windsurfing, sailing, scuba diving, swimming. It's been my whole life is the ocean. Or so, yeah, it, 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 it's a, a tough life too. It's hard to have a family to be an oceanographer and be out on a ship all the time. And I imagine the, the pay is not as, as good as say a, a doctor and that would have been a little tougher. 
I'm glad I became a doctor. You know, many of you know the reason I became a doctor is because I had a stroke when I was 18. And by the way, uh, I found the picture. I, I couldn't believe it. I thought that everything was lost in the fire, AJ. But I found a picture of me sitting on my hospital bed at Grace Hospital when I was 18. You know, the day after I had my stroke. And I'm sitting there on the bed. I've got an oxygen cannula in my nose. And I've got a pack of Marlboro cigarettes sitting on the table in front of me. <laughs> I, I, I believe me, the way I took care of myself, I'm lucky I'm alive, but I found out some really important things about food in my mid twenties. And otherwise I wouldn't be talking to you right now today. I've been gone. Quit the tobacco too, sure did. <laughs> Mary, I was raised in a Jewish family and there was only one profession that was acceptable and that was doctor. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, okay. really. And I didn't, I didn't become that. But do you know what the first words a Jewish baby girl says the minute she's born? Mm. So you're a doctor? <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. I went to the University of Pennsylvania, but I, I went to an Ivy League school, but I just couldn't do it. I just, I don't like blood. I don't like touching people. Well, you know, I just couldn't do it. Tried. Yeah, I, th I think it makes a difference in what, what kind of a family that you're raised in as as to the profession that you choose. I mean, there are some people that are really independent and um, will just go out and this is what I want to do. And we hear all the time about um, people that had fights with their family and almost had to break off with their family because this is what they wanted to do and their family expected them to do something else. So a family does play into it a little bit, unfortunately. So so my, my, my mother was, uh, she had a pretty tough time in life. She went through the depression, real difficult. And uh, when she got married, uh, she wanted to have doctors in her family. But we were raised in a family where doctors were next to, next to God. You know, nothing like any of my family members. And of course I felt the same way. I felt like I could never aspire to that kind of profession. These people are next to God. But I had that exposure when I had my stroke at 18 years of age. So I met next to God and I figured I could do that. <laughs> and, uh, and my mother wanted uh, doctors uh, in her family. She ended up with me, my brother, who's a board certified internist, my sister, who's a nurse, who's married to a board certified occupational therapy doctor. So she got three doctors <laughs> out of four kids. That's amazing. We had two in our family out of four yeah. kids for that. That's terrific. A question from, who is this from? Bridget, how do I get iodine without salt or sea vegetables? Oh, well, it's, it's in all your vegetables, as long as they're not grown in iodine, iodine deficient soils. There are iodine deficient soils like uh, the goiter belt, which used to be in the area of Michigan where the soils were depleted of iodine, but other soils like, you know, particularly any soil that uh, exists by the sea, you know, that has iodine from the ocean. And, but, but most, most soils around the world, well, that, there's limitations of, there are goiter belts in Africa, but otherwise most soils have uh, plenty of iodine in them. And when people ate, from the local environment, everything came within 25 miles of their home. Then if you lived in on soil that was deficient, you could run into a problem like the goiter belts. But that's not the way we eat these days. You eat uh, apples grown in Washington and corn grown in Nebraska and bananas grown in Jamaica. I mean, you eat, you eat foods from all over the world growing in all different kinds of soil. So it's really never a practical issue developing mineral deficiency. Now that's mineral deficiency, vitamin deficiency. Vitamins are made by plants for their own purposes. The plant doesn't become a plant unless it has these particular chemicals in it. They're called vitamins. They're vitamins for us because we require them. They're micronutrients that we require from our food. Remember, I told you there are 13 known vitamins. 11 of them are made by plants. That's the conspiracy. One is not a vitamin, it's a hormone. It's called D. 
And the last one is B12, which is made by bacteria, which was never a problem until people became hygienic. And then it's still almost never a problem. The risk of B12 deficiency being a disease is far less than one in a million people. Even vegans, you know, less than one in a million vegans will become B12 deficient expressed as a disease, you know, expressed as biochemical changes that you get on, on very sophisticated tests. That's a whole nother thing. But as far as an actual clinical problem, your risk is less than one in a million for B12 deficiency. 11 of the 13 vitamins are made by plants. <laughs> Only plants can make essential fats. Only plants make essential amino acids. There's a conspiracy out here probably forcing us to look at plants as our, our nutrition. Wow. Let's see. Uh, what does Dr. McDougall think about the lifeline screening tests? I'm not really sure what that is. Well, my, my, I would guess this is a, a, a dog and pony show that comes to their community and tests. Uh, does. Oh, no, I think it's that thing on TV where you can test for allergies. And... Oh, I know nothing about that. Isn't that the one that they're talking about? I, I don't know what it is. I, I, I've never heard of it. You, you, you prick oh, your yeah. finger and you, you send in these blood samples and they tell you what kind of food you're allergic to or what kind of pollens you're allergic to. Well, that's, that's what I think it is. Okay. Well, that, that could but be. I, I, I'm not sure. It could be. It shows you how little I know about it. So I should probably <laughs> keep my comments. <laughs> But you don't like when we look for things because that's the problem when you go to doctors, they, they always find something, you know? Right. Yeah. If you look, you will find. It's just like one of the, one of the statistics I like to share with people is if you take 2000 healthy people and you do CAT scans on them, you'll find 1,300 abnormalities in healthy people. You'll find 1,300 things wrong which will require further tests and treatments. And certainly a whole bunch of worry. Oh, you know, you know, patient, uh, we, we did this uh, lung scan on you and we see a, a little thing. It could be a nodule, you know, it could be a cancer too. Well, you know, those kind of findings do a tremendous amount of harm. Well, those could be are really tough for people to listen to, you know. They're it saying it's this a or it could oh, be that and people just, and, and doc, oh, and well, I better find out that if it is or not. Doctors being trying to be as honest as they possibly could be, they give you the options. Well, could it really be cancer, doc? Well, sure, it could be cancer. And besides that, if I miss it, I'm going to get sued. So let's just <laughs> say it's cancer. People are saying it's some kind of cardiac screening. Um, yeah, I don't know. But yeah. you know what? I, oh, I, is that the one where you put your, your fingers on this test and it goes? I don't know. I've never heard of it. They got a lot of gimmicks out there, like this portable EKG thing. Yeah, that's what I was talking yeah, about. Lifeline you... screening is screening for arteries and for osteoporosis, the person that asked. Well, then arteries. again, I'll go back to the dog and pony show. Yeah. Which they, which they <laughs> come through your town and they, they come through with these machines, uh, e echoes and how do you really feel? How do you really feel? Oh my God. Uh, you know, those are condemned by every aspect of standard medicine I know of as being dog and pony shows. That's so funny. They, 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 you know, don't result in better health for you, but they're, you know, they're really, really sexy. And gee, for just a thousand dollars, I can find all these things about myself. Well, you don't want to know these things about yourself. There's something wrong. Yourself will tell you there's something wrong. You'll have pain. Other things about your body will be obviously changed if there's something wrong. Don't go looking for trouble because you'll find it. <laughs> Absolutely. Carolyn says, my recent TSH results were over six and the doctor wanted to put me on thyroid medicine. Will food reverse this? No, no, it won't reverse it. Uh, you, you, the doctor will probably continue by telling you you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis autoimmune thyroiditis, they'll say. That's where the body attacks the thyroid gland. And I go th went through a whole explanation when I did your show a couple of weeks ago on autoimmune diseases, I explained how the body attacks the thyroid gland. It does it by eating foreign thyroids. That means thyroid's not of self, foreign thyroids. Where do you get foreign thyroids from? 
you get them from a slaughterhouse, but it's served to you as hot dogs and sausages. They waste nothing in a slaughterhouse. So the tails and the ears and the vaginas and the spleens and the lymph nodes and the, that's a hot dog. <laughs> Thyroid glands, uh, uh, hair follicles. They, they all go into the mixture and you eat these things and the body recognizes them as form. But they're similar enough to proteins that are in your body that it gets confused. And through a process called molecular mimicry, it attacks your own thyroid gland. That's how I believe it works. Now, once the gland is destroyed, as it is, I would guess in your case, not totally destroyed, but a lot of us destroyed, then what you do is if you are at a such a level, I think six is high enough to do it. Uh, my son doesn't, he doesn't treat people, I believe, if I have his, yeah, his think, present criteria yeah. in mind. He, did, he wouldn't treat somebody with a TSH of six, but I would. You know, doctors are a little, a little varied when you go to those kinds of elevations as to what you should do. It's, you know, it's up for discussion. I wouldn't cre criticize anybody one way or the other if they started supplements or not. And I always use synthetic thyroid, synthroid. And the reason I don't give armor thyroid or natural thyroid is because it's made from the glands they get out of the slaughterhouse. <laughs> you stick your nose in the bottle and smell it. Gross. Smells like dead pigs. So gross that they still do that. Yeah. And it spreads, it spreads microbes. That's the problem. It's prions that cause mad cow disease, leukemia viruses, et cetera. You, when you eat these things from cows, cancer-causing viruses, boy, oh boy, that doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? No. We had a funny comment from Yossi when you were saying what hot dogs are made from. And <laughs> she writes, well, that's why they're called wieners. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. That, that I wouldn't carry that far. Thank you very much. Oh, I love it. Uh, people are asking if you stop smoking, how long does it take for the damage to be reversed? And is it always reversed? Well, they say at seven years, you uh, suffer the same statistics as somebody who never started smoking. So if you survive for seven years, uh, pretty much your, your statistics are, are pretty favorable. You know, I've been. Oh, that's good. Yeah. We've been we've been non-smokers for way more than seven years. Yeah, October twentieth, nineteen seventy-two, at seven in the morning, I stopped smoking. God, you remember everything. What? How? What, no, what did, because it what? was a big, big, big deal <laughs> yeah. to overcome that addiction. It was one of the hardest things I ever did. Uh, but I, but I, that was I was in my mid twenties then. So it's got to be, that's all be 50 years we haven't smoked. Yeah, well, October 20, yeah, October. 1972 is, yeah, yeah, 50 years ago, I stopped smoking. <laughs> wow. Do you ever, like, I'm, I'm sure you have an iPhone. Do you ever, like, take videos of anything? Do you ever do that? Yeah, I do. He doesn't. Well, why, why don't you, wouldn't it be cool if you could live stream from your 50th medical school reunion? Oh, all right. <laughs> if I go. You know, I'm a little concerned about traveling these days. Oh, but if you do go, Glad, we would love to see that, you know? So I've, I've been asking people like what they would like to see because you're going to be back in a couple of weeks and we're getting a lot of things. We're getting GI, we're getting, so really they don't really care. They just love spending time with you. How, how, I have a show at two, but if you'd like to go longer or we could say, I, I mean, no, I, no, I, let, let's let you, let you go. I think there, our audience has put up with enough. Yeah, I, so, it's just it's so hard saying goodbye to you guys. Yeah, it's just well, so much fun. It just the time just really flies by, you know. Well, I mean, it, it is fun, AJ, and we and again, I really appreciate uh, you making your audience available to us. And well, they seem to really love you because they stay on the whole time, and we always get at least five hundred when you're on. Sometimes right. more. Well, we'll you see know, in a couple of weeks then. Yeah, well, we're and he'll he'll let you know what he's going to talk about. Yeah, I'll let you know. Right. We're competing right now because there's this online conference that's running that you you are a speaker and I just yeah. spoke at called the Real Truth About Health. So that so that's why a couple 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 hundred people are over there watching. But I'm sure they'll watch the replay. All right. Talk to you. Right. Talk to you in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much, Bye -bye. and thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back in thirty minutes when my guest is Nate Maris, and he is going to be making nori rolls. Thanks for watching, everyone.